to fully understand who I am, you need to understand what I believe in. I am what many people call someone who is cut from a different mold. I was raised to be a woman of substance, quietness, and unassuming. During those years, what were often known among families and friends, it was not, not discussed. There was no dirty laundry to be aired in our household. We kept our family business close to our chests and simply did not talk about things that could reflect badly on a family member. People today will talk about anything, <laughs> especially if offered the right price. Even at the expense of family and friends, my choice to remain silent for over 60 years was the relationship I had with my father. He never once said to me, uh, don't talk about our relationship. I did not want to talk about the relationship. Uh, he was a wonderful person, and there was no reason to share uh, our experiences with other people, especially under the circumstances. He was a public figure, and I felt that any news that was not positive would not go over very well, so therefore I had no reason to share that with the public. Being raised by two wonderful people, my uncle and my aunt, I thought they were my parents for a long time. Uh, my aunt uh, had a son, uh, the pictures in the book of her son, and also of my brother and other people, but he seemed so much like my own brother because we grew up together. Through the years, the strength of my character is having faith in God. He has brought me through life's challenges and changing times. I have learned forgiveness and developed a tender heart. God has a way of working things out, and he is always on time. <laughs> Many people felt that I should have shared my story years ago. I know that some of the people with the civil rights uh, movement felt that if I had come out and told my story, it might have had a great effect as far as the passage of civil rights at an earlier date. That's all speculation. We don't know what it would have done. And some of the same people who were so critical hadn't done anything themselves for civil rights. <laughs> okay. Uh, during the 60s, when African Americans were not given opportunities that they have today, uh, many people felt that was another reason that I should have come out. Uh, and many times I had to persist in order to get things done. I was determined to beat the odds and come through life, life's changing time, as a victim not a victim. Through it all, I still feel there are many things that people can do uh, to make themselves have a better life. Because you have problems, it does not mean that you are done for. You can overcome your problems. It all depends on your attitude. I'm encouraged to teach love in the spirit and in truth. Through my personal triumphs, hopefully people will learn the value and respect we need for each other, regardless of color or race. My I, Early in life, I had some disappointments, as many of you have, I'm sure. But again, I think it's the way that you handle them. For example, I did not meet my real mother until I was about 12 or 13 years old. She had lived in the South when my aunt and uncle moved to Pennsylvania and had taken me to a place called Coatesville, Pennsylvania, near Philadelphia, uh, and I was only six months old. And then not return to the South until I had an aunt who passed, and actually when we all went to the funeral. 
So while we were there, my mother went to see if she could locate my father. Fortunately, she did. And then she came back to get me. And on the way, for the first time, told me all about my father uh, and the relationship she had with that family. She had worked for the family as a cook. Her sister also worked with her, but she was the housekeeper. And she and my father became very friendly. And I do believe there was a true love there because all the years after that, whenever I see him, which was every year, and see her, they always ask about each other. And uh, they seem to maintain an interest after all of those years. So once I met my father in April of 1941, he went into the service when the Pearl Harbor War broke out. And I didn't hear from him for about three years. Uh, but once he came back, uh, from then on, I saw him at least once a year, if not in Washington. And, and for example, when I was in school and he was the governor, I would see him there also. So he was very wonderful to me and to my family and we really grew to really care for each other. Now, Dr. Robert Schuler has a book called Tough Times Don't Last, but tough people do. So I've had to tough it out all my life because there were always some types of problems that would come up. So as I said a little earlier, it's how you handle those problems that can still make you a success. I've had to overcome many hurdles, and it's not always easy, but you just can't give up. Give up. And you can rise through it all. I would like to read a paragraph from my book. Uh, one of the things I'd also like to mention is the fact that I'm a member of the BAR. Uh, my daughter, Rhonda, is also. There were people in Orange County who wanted us to join the chapter there, but it was so far from us. And we were approached by the president, and she encouraged us. She did all the research to join, and it was in Hollywood. So that was convenient, and we decided to join. And I've had many people say, well, why would you join the DAR? All that some people know about the DAR, DAR uh, was when Marin Anderson could not sing in Washington, and Mrs. Roosevelt withdrew her membership. That's all that they remember. We want to remember Marin Anderson for the famous uh, singer that she was, not for some little small incident. And the reason we joined also is because I had been active with the Black Patriots Organization in Washington, D.C. Now, there were many black Americans who fought in the Revolutionary War. However, they were never recognized. So this organization has been raising funds to build a monument to them in Washington along with the others. And we had five to 6,000 African Americans who died in that war. And we need to remember them and honor them. So for these reasons, we felt it was reason enough to, to join the group. And they do many wonderful things in the community, especially as far as some of the schools, and assisting students, or students are concerned. Now the part that I would like to read uh, from the book is uh, the last paragraph. And it reads like this. Many, many of those who decry my joining of uh, the UDC tend to categorize me as a black person. They may make the more subtle argument that Anyone who's lived through and supported the civil rights movement should never join uh, an organization associated with the abridgment of those rights. To them, the Confederacy, as well as its flag, are old times in Dixie that should be forgotten. But what really bothers the, these critics is that a black person will consider honoring the Confederacy that perpetuated the enslavement of his or her ancestors. Such labeling 
is as racist in its own way and therefore uh, I feel that I'm as much white as I am black. However, I grew up with a black family and have always considered myself as a black person. Uh, it is my intention, however, to drink the nectar of both goblets. History is complete, complex, and mine is as complex as it gets. Context of white supremacy. Gusty Renegade in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date, Thursday, March 31, 2022. So I have been told victims guaranteed qualified. This is our book club third installment on Dear Senator, the memoir of Essie May Washington Williams uh, with William Stadium co-authoring the text as well. White man suspected racist. Uh, one quick comment I'll make and then I'll, I'll share a few thoughts on the segment that we just heard from the author of the text that we're reading. Normally. I work to include, if we're reading a text, the vast majority of the books that we've read over the past 10 years. The author has done one interview, at least, that's on YouTube, if not dozens, uh, that are online and all over the place. So generally, I try to include uh, segments so that we can hear the author talking about the specific book that we're reading. I think that that's helpful. Uh, just to give a little bit more background information about the person that we're reading about, some of their thoughts about the book, uh, things that we can keep in mind as we're going to help us get a better understanding of what we're reading. Uh, we heard from Alice Siebold. We heard from Toni Morrison, the several times of her books, President Barack Obama, pretty much everybody that we've re uh, read, uh, we've heard them chatting about the book. Normally, I try to get one of the first times uh, that we read a book, I try to include a segment with the author. This time around, it's you know our third installment, and this is our first time hearing directly from S. E. May Washington Williams. Why did that happen? One, uh, the narrative kind of gives some of the big reveals beginning in chapter two with uh, the year 1938. That's what it's titled before she even gives any information about who her real mother is, who her real father is, she talks about the lynching of Zachariah Walker. We had audio about that lynching uh, in week one because that seems like such a pivotal moment and she keeps mentioning him throughout the text. So if that continues, that's why we started with that one. And then the second week, last week, we started with audio of Janetta Rose Barris, uh, her book, Whatever Happened to Daddy's Little Girl. And particularly hearing what uh, Miss Essie May had to say this week, it was very deliberate to kind of really spend some time thinking about not just father hunger and growing up and, and not knowing your actual father, but I grow up for 13 years thinking that this black male is my father and he leaves and I no longer have contact with him. So I had that abandonment. And then I found out, whoa, this isn't even my father. In fact, my father is a white man racist who was raping my mother when she was 15. That is an entirely different level of father hunger. And then to include the report that Janetta Rose Barras authored uh, about S.E. May Washington Williams specifically. I thought that was so critically important to kind of evaluating everything that we hear moving forward in the text. Now, S.E. May Washington Williams, and I think it's important, she was speaking at the Strom Thurmond Institute at Clemson University in South Carolina audience very important for where this is happening at Clemson uh, Pitchfork Ben Tillman would be one of the co-founders right I'll see if I can get through my notes quickly and then we'll pivot directly to the text wow 
she starts she says that Strom Thurmond was a wonderful person and she says that repeatedly now in a few sentences she says that her aunt Mary and uncle John Henry Washington that they also were wonderful I don't know what she means when she says wonderful but it is challenging to grasp the meaning of that word if a white man who flagrantly practiced white supremacy racism raped a black child <laughs> he's wonderful whatever that means and then a black male who took care of this child as his own for years is also wonderful confusion could be the word for this text she continues she says forget oh, the religion of white supremacy she talks about uh, the importance of forgiveness Dr. Welsing talked about that being the slave mentality right uh, and that it put it in God's hands God will work things out man if you want to talk about religion of white supremacy and how we have been conditioned to think about the world not using logic just put it in white Jesus's hands and the end we had white people Strom Thurmond was described as Lord of the plantation last week continuing she says I thought it was so and so we're at the Strom Thurmond Institute at Clemson University in the small segment that we heard in my view she takes two shots at black people specifically what are those two shots the first time around she takes a shot saying that black people and you have to kind of parse this together she says people in the civil rights movement I don't think you had tons of Strom Thurmond and what have you in the so-called civil rights movement I certainly don't think that you would have had white people uh, in the so-called civil rights movement at that time uh, Schwerner Goodman right I don't think those individuals would have been pressuring uh, Essie Mae Washington Williams to reveal that Strom Thurmond was her father so my suspicion is that she's talking about black people we have said hey Miss Essie Mae you should share this this might you know he's out here talking all this about raping black males and you all can't be going to school with us and separation and stay away from the niggers yeah you should do this this will reveal them as, as being total hypocrites and and all the rest of it VGQ victims guarantee qualified if she doesn't want to reveal this information that's up to her and I can I can totally respect not wanting to talk about your mother being raped as a child however to add in at the Strom Thurmond Institute that these black people that I suspect that she's talking about were making this request you know come on why don't you share this when they hadn't done anything for civil rights themselves hold on now if you're talking about anyone who is classified as not white oh there might be substantial reasons why they didn't do anything for so called civil rights whatever that means one of them you can start with your white father keeping it real citizens council and all the rest areas like South Carolina my goodness it could be dangerous fatal to be associated with so called civil rights so if anyone is to blame that's not shiftless black people being hypocrites asking you to share something and they didn't do it black people have been a Zachariah Walker the other shot that's taken at black people about her joining that she said the DAR uh, I am I try not to give out acronyms without giving specifics she wanted to join the daughters of the Confederacy I have multiple newspaper reports to con uh, substantiate that um, again this is one talking about black people because she said she and and to not even just be direct black people they got to be tongue-in-cheek and kind of make this veiled people who had been mistreated and all that black people had a problem with her joining the daughters of the confederacy and how are you connected to this you're a black person and she says hey I am white and black and she even gives us the metaphor I intend to drink from both goblets and you hear a chuckle from the crowd at the Strom Thurmond Institute at Clemson University in South Carolina 
wow like and we're reading that on this week where i talked about it may have been staged chris rock and will smith but either way like disparaging a black male's attempted wife in a room full of white people like for the giggles of racist suspects like really really even if the black people whatever view they had about you joining this organization VGQ to them they certainly don't have any ability to stop you from joining right they can just give their opinion that's about it two shots at black people and Strom Thurmond is wonderful that's when we hear Neely Fuller Jr. say massive act of racist aggre- maximum racist aggression with any sort of sexual activity with a non-white person the result right then particularly for the offspring oh disgusting all the way anywho uh, and, 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 and she said she used the term relationship with her father this is someone that you didn't see had no contact with for the most pivotal years of your life as he's off uh, World War II fighting Tojo and company you don't see him for three years and then you see him you say at least once a year and it's not like this is hanging out and we're doing dinners and such together and doing retreats and doing yoga I don't think that's not the type of interaction that she described relationship interesting also and isn't this common though we hear how often have we heard a non-white person say I'm not a victim I'm all for perseverance it would be impossible to do 13 years of attempted counter racist broadcasting if I was about laying down quitting and giving up so we're in total agreement there but I mean wow I am the product of a racist child rapist but I'm not a victim I've had problems in fact the most poignant line in the book she says last week they go to the law office of Strom Thurmond a black male answers the door and she's about to run and put her arms around him thinking that that's her father nope that would be the racist white man but she's not a victim Victor, that's what she said. Again, VGQ. So if you say you're not a victim, no problem. But wow, the word for the book could easily be confusion. We will pick up in chapter three. Uh, Calliope, she was saying it's pickings and pickaninnies, talking about the history of raping, probably child rape in South Carolina white men like Strom Thurmond, Ben Tillman, raping black children, males and females probably. Context of White Supremacy, Dear Senator S.E. May Washington Williams, audio segment one. All right. What Strom Thurmond was doing with me then was part of a long Edgefield tradition. Another aunt told me that Judge Thurmond was supporting my mother. That was why she didn't have to work. I didn't ask her about the arrangement. Money I had been taught was none of my business. I also heard that Carrie took trips down to South Carolina to see the judge. But if money was none of my business, love life was even less. I was still fairly shy with Carrie. We were still in the getting to know each other phase. Moreover, I had barely seen her after our trip to Edgefield together. There had been a few daily visits on weekends when we were never alone but were with other relatives. I yearned to sleep in the bed with her again to feel like a daughter. I also dreamed of getting a letter from my father. If he were a true southern gentleman, how could he just forget about me like this? How could he be that cold and distant? He had seemed so interested in me. Was he only being polite? The only person who could answer the question was Carrie, and I needed to be alone to ask. If I tried to ask Mary, 
I worried that she might have been hurt. Obviously, she and Carrie had agreed that Mary would be my full-time mother. If I asked too much about my other parents, I might be jeopardizing the ties to the one I had. I didn't want to be left with no one at all. Despite having what seemed to be more parents than any girl could handle, my biggest fear was ending up an orphan. I was listening to the hit song, Deep in the Heart of Texas, when I heard about Pearl Harbor that December. Everyone's world immediately was turned upside down. War was all around us. But none of my friends thought we as Americans would go to war. Now we had been attacked, and we had no choice. We were all scared. Scared of Hitler on one side and the Japanese on the other. Many of the boys in the high school immediately began enlisting. I knew I might never see many of them again. Worrying about my parentage took a distant second place to survival. But it still would have been reassuring to share my fears with someone who truly cared about me, and I wasn't sure who that was. He's volunteered, Carrie told me, taking me aside when she came for a Christmas visit. Isn't he too old? I knew the judge was now around 40. Yes, but he's a lieutenant in the reserves, she said, knowing everything about him. Judges are exempt, but he's very patriotic, and he knows the right people. He's an Edgefield man, she said proudly. They need to fight. It's in their blood. His grandfather was right beside Robert E. Lee when he surrendered. War runs in the family. But is it really our family? I wanted to ask her. Talk about being the poor relations. We were the invisible relations. What bothered me the most was that my mother never told me that my father said goodbye to me as he was going off to war. As it turned out, he didn't go overseas for over a year. But I didn't know that at the time. Maybe he did love my mother, or maybe he used her. But where I was concerned, my father didn't seem to care. As Coatesville hunkered down for war, I tried my hardest to put Strom Thurmond out of my mind. Yet, like a moth to a flame, I couldn't stop reading about South Carolina and the gone with the wind world that was at least half my birthright, but was a birthright I could not claim. I wanted to find out the worst about this forbidden family so that I could hate them and want nothing to do with them. After all, did they not formerly own slaves? And was not Will Thurman the genius who put the pitchfork in the hands of Ben Tillman so that he could wield it against black people? And what was my father up to? What kind of justice to blacks did he dispense? Back at her rooming house, Aunt Ca Calliope told me more about slavery. She was never whipped or chained or abused in any way, she said. She worked in the house, not in the fields, but even there, she recalled no brutality. One day we were working for rich people, and the next day we were working for poor people, was how she described the upheaval the Civil War brought. Most slaves stayed with their old masters. Because the Yankees confiscated whatever wealth the masters had, the freedmen worked for nothing except food and lodging, or as sharecroppers. Nothing changed much for us. We prayed a lot before, and we prayed a lot after. As far as politics was concerned, Calliope barely remembered the brief period of, during the radical Reconstruction when newly enfranchised blacks dominated the state legislature and went to Congress. The Yankees ran that show, she recalled. She could barely remember having the vote. We had it, and then they took it away. It was like a school play, having our people in the state house. But then they canceled the play, and they took our vote away. They called it civil rights, but there wasn't nothing civil about it. The strange part 
was that the people who took away the civil rights that the Civil War had been fought for were the former slave owners, the masses Calliope and her people had been so loyal to. In essence, my white family had gone to war against my black family. This war of redemption to rescue the Old South from the blacks and their Yankee puppeteers was led by a coalition of the Confederate aristocracy that included both the Butlers and the Thurmans. In fact, Edgefield was the nerve center of South Carolina's freedom fight against Reconstruction and the Northern occupation. The key man here was General Matthew Calbraith Butler, who lost a foot in a Civil War battle but returned to fight in the next, mounted on his white steed. Butler was the cousin of Preston Brooks, the bold assailant of Charles Sumner. In the small town of Edgefield, everyone was king, as Calliope said. This was certainly true among the ruling class, who were equally united in their desire to reclaim the power they had always enjoyed. General Butler's partner in redemption was another Edgefield fighting man, General Martin Witherspoon Gary, a Harvard Law School graduate known as the Bald Eagle of the Confederacy. Gary not only used his legal skills in defending Klan leaders accused of fomenting violence, but also his military skills to foment it himself. Gary and Butler were the mastermind of the rifle clubs that sprung up to cloak mob violence in the respectability of polite gentlemen's sporting societies. The showdown between the old guard and the new occurred in 1876 in a town near Edgefield called Hamburg. The largely black state militia had its authority challenged by a Butler-led confederacy of rifle clubs, including the Sweetwater Sabre Club, which was headed by the pre-Pitchfork Ben Tillman. The United Clubs wore makeshift uniforms that consisted of a chemise dyed blood red with berry juice. From this, the rebels became known as the Red Shirts. Outnumbered by the swaggering red shirts, the black militiamen tried to defend themselves and shot and killed one white man. One was all it took to incite what became known as the Hamburg Massacre. The red shirts attacked the militiamen, seizing 40 prisoners, one by one. They would bring a captive out into Main Street and shoot him in the head. Then, in true sporting fox hunt style, they released the other captives and chased them down, shooting them as they caught them. It reminded me of the Coatesville burning of Zack Walker, though the evils were multiplied. Despite Republican control of the legal apparatus of the state, the red shirts were not punished in any way. Butler, getting on his aristocratic high horse, flatly denied he or his clubmen had any responsibility for the carnage. Instead, he blamed a faceless mob of poor white trash, local Irish immigrant factory workers, for going on a drunken spree. No witnesses were bold enough to step forward to contradict the formidable general. A few months later, Ben Tillman led another massacre at nearby Ellington. Forty more blacks were executed in a swamp. The bodies remained on the ground for days, for no one dared come out to bury their friends for fear of joining them in the hereafter. Again, no witnesses came forward, and no punishment was meted out. In the gubernatorial elections of that year, the red shirts terrorized the polls and prevented enough blacks from voting to elect one of their own, a patrician general, Wade Hampton III. An enormous mountain of a man, Hampton, in his leisure time, liked to play the mountain man, hunting bear with his bare hands and a huge knife. Before the Civil War, he was the largest slave owner in the whole South, possessing at one time over 3,000 slaves. After the war, he was forced to declare bankruptcy, selling his once priceless English antiques on the Columbia Courthouse steps for the less than princely sum of barely a hundred dollars. 
The Scalawag Governor Franklin Moses having been banished, there was no other market in the post-war South for the finer things. With no money, the former U.S. Senator Hampton had no choice but to return to politics. The red shirts fastened onto Hampton as a powerful symbol of what used to be. They paraded him around to campaign rallies in a Roman-style chariot like a gladiator, wearing a laurel wreath around his head. Aunt Calliope described the political rallies as a kind of medicine show. On the dais where Hampton was to speak sat a black sack tied up in chains and labeled South Carolina. The moment Hampton ascended to speak, a beautiful blonde, all dressed in white robes, would emerge from the sack. The band would play Dixie and the crowd would go wild. Because blacks still had the vote and even the most shameless intimidation tactics weren't foolproof, Hampton went after it. Many of his 3,000 former chattels were trotted out to offer testimonials to his benevolence. Among black voters, his biggest campaign asset was his mama, Nellie, who had raised him. That clinched it for him. Calliope remembered, Wade Hampton wasn't a bad man. It was the ones behind him who were up to no good. Armed with this support, Hampton won a photo finish election. Just as tight was the 1876 presidential race between Hayes and Ty Tilden. By this year, enough old Southern Democrats had gotten themselves pardoned and re-elected to Congress to politic against the radical Republicans. Hayes was Republican, but not radical, and was willing to play ball. Thus, the Southern De Democrats cut a deal with him, throwing their support to Hayes in return for his promise to end Reconstruction and take the federal troops out of the South. It was Yankee go home, and it worked. Ben Tillman and the Red Shirts were never prosecuted, and Matthew C. Gary went to Washington as South Carolina's new senator. The South was about to rise again. The new Messiah was the new Messiah here was Ben Tillman, and his Fengali was my grandfather Will Thurman. It didn't make me feel good that Tillman was arguably the meanest man in the history of American politics and my grandfather was the man he turned to for meanness. To try to defend Tillman was to try to defend my family, and in 1941 I was trying to do precisely the opposite. The more I learned, the more I w wanted to wash those white people right out of my black, non-cheerleader hair. But a lot of white people thought the pitchfork was a great man, and I kept on reading to try to understand why. In his own way, Tillman was what we might call a progressive. Southern admirers called him the agricultural Moses, leading the farmers toward a promised land that never fully bore fruit. He was the champion of the small farmer, not the big planter, and instituted many reforms that benefited the common man, as long as he was white. He founded the new agricultural college at Clemson, where my father eventually graduated. He was a great friend of public education and inspired my father to become a teacher and an expert in agriculture. Not that Tillman was a farmer himself. He came from a distinguished, slave-owning Edgefield family and was highly educated. He loved writing poetry and quoting the classics, almost as much as denouncing the Negro. He used his upper crust connections to drive the Yankees out of South Carolina. Then he used his populist charisma to drive the aristocrats into oblivion. Much on the advice of Will Thurmond. Nobody spoke as good as he did, Calliope reminisced about Tillman. Again, she spoke without rancor, which confused me. But he hated you, I said. He didn't hate me, she replied. When you live as long as I have, you best think about love, not hate. The genius of Ben Tillman, and thus the genius of Will Thurman behind him, was to give his beloved small farmers someone above them to resent 
and someone below them to take it out on. After generations of being scorned by the planter elite as the lowest caste of society, blacks as slaves were outside society and hence didn't count, it empowered the poor whites to feel superior to someone now that blacks had entered the calculus of American life. Before they'd only looked up, now they could look down, Calliope explained. The Negro crisis, invented by Tillman and Thurman, gave the poor whites a crisis to respond to, as well as an opportunity to save their civilization. Nobody had ever called the piney woods of this dirt farmer's civilization. Tillman thus gave them pride, and they gave him their votes. Elected governor in 1890, he went to the U.S. Senate in 1894, seceding his ally Matthew C. Butler, and remained there until his death in 1918. Tillman's mission was to put uppity niggas in their place. Despite the Klan, despite the red shirts, despite a million obstacles, blacks in the South had made progress in the two decades following the Civil War. The threat to whites was that this progress had only just begun. Tillman was presented as the man to stop it, the terminator of black advancement. The first stop was the ballot box. Once blacks had achieved political equality, social equality would inev inevitably follow. They could vote themselves into white schools, white trains, white parks, white neighborhoods. Voting, the key to civil rights, guaranteed by the 14th and 15th Amendment, the Civil War's constitutional legacy, had to be abridged. Violence wasn't enough to stem the oncoming tide. Originally, right after the war, the argument was made that freed slaves, because of their lack of education, were too ignorant to vote and would simply be the tools of unscrupulous Yankee political profiteers or scallywags like Franklin Moses. But now, two decades later, blacks were getting some education. Separate and hardly equal, but it was an education nonetheless. This knowledge was power, a power that had to be snuffed out. There were clever legal ways to do this, ways dreamed up, by the brilliant mind of Will Thurman, hitting the Negro where it hurt, with literacy requirements, poll taxes, and residence rules. They asked me how old Cross was when he was born, Calliope recalled, giving me an example of the kind of test voter registrars put blacks through. She had no clue and was denied. Later she moved to another county and somehow passed because the registrar knew she had been loyal, um, a loyal servant of the butlers and would vote the Democratic line. Ben Tillman was good to his people, she said, meaning his slaves. She told me how he built a mausoleum for his main manservant, his best friend in the world. He just wanted to get elected, she said, dismissing his lynch advocacy as mere campaign rhetoric. Once Clypey got her vote, she cast it for the pitchfork. She was a sucker for Wade Hampton's mama for Ben Tillman's valet. He was a good man, she maintained to the end, just doing his job. Tillman's job was taking away everything black people had gained from the war and leaving them in constant fear of the white mob. As another uncle said to me, I don't think the Jews in Germany are in any more fear of Hitler than the blacks in South Carolina were of Tillman. I read a speech Tillman gave in which he advocated lynching as an acceptable form of justice for blacks and exhorted the mob to kill, kill, kill the Negro rapists, which is what he reduced all black men to be. Tillman styled himself the great defender of white, southern, female purity, if not chastity. I wonder what he would have thought of his wizard son, my father. What follows is my understanding of the racial philosophy of Ben Tillman, as at least partially conceived by Will Thurman and ostensibly espoused by my father, Strom Thurman. It became the Southern racial orthodoxy, and as such made me feel like the worst blot my proud white family could conceivably have. During his five decades of influence on the national political stage, Ben Tillman carried this philosophy around the country, 
north and south, east and west, and apparently found millions of adherents. The rest of the country didn't have quite the issue with the Negro as Tillman did in the South. But as I learned in Coatesville, crossing the Mason-Dixon line did not make the race problem disappear. Tillman was a brilliant and charismatic orator, and he drew huge admiring crowds just like the crowds that burned Zachariah Walker in 1911 at the pinnacle of Tillman's popularity. What I call the Tillman solution, a plan to totally subjugate the black race, was not that far removed from the final solution espoused by our war enemy, Hitler. What Tillman believed in was something he called race antagonism, a kind of racial Darwinism in which each race wanted to dominate all others. In his mind, the master race was the white Anglo-Saxon race, which he called the flower of humanity and gave credit for most of civilization as we knew it. Blacks, in his view, were barbarian Africans, an inferior and savage race, marked only for toil and hard, menial, thoughtless labor. Any progress the blacks had made, Tillman attributed to the benefits of slavery. White slave owners had civilized and Christianized their savage chattels, proof of which was how loyal many blacks were to their masters during the Civil War and in the early years of emancipation. During racial reconstruction, the venal Yankee occupiers of the South gave the freedmen what Tillman called a taste of blood. The virus of equality infected the race with the dire results of an unquenchable desire for equality, political and social. They wanted the State House, then they wanted the White House, not only the one in Washington, but the little one on Elm Street. In short, the new Negro would be satisfied with nothing less than to marry a white woman. When that did not happen, the Negroes reverted to their savage jungle natures, taking out their animalistic anger uh, by raping white women. That, above all, was what white America had to rally to protect itself from. This visceral threat to hurt, to hearth and home cut to the quick and galvanized a nation into race hatred. When Tillman was asked about white women raping white men raping black women, he dismissed the question as one of extremely poor taste, as if no white men could be so debased as to desire a black woman. What would he have thought about Strom Thurmond and my mother? Probably that my father was in severe need of counseling. He didn't give white men a free pass with black women because he couldn't seem to imagine a civilized white man ever coveting one. And if civilized white men acted like savages and lynching blacks, it was justified as protection of the race, if not chivalry. Tillman advocated mass search parties to hunt down and shoot young black men like Zack Walker, whom he equated with jungle animals. We must hunt Butler of Edgefield. We must hunt these creatures with the same terrified vigor that we would look for tigers and bears. Tillman was a maestro at orchestrating white rage. When Booker T. Washington became the first black invited to dine at the White House by Theodore Roosevelt, Tillman turned, into a, turned it into a national scandal, proof of all his crackpot theories. The only corrective to Roosevelt's entertaining that nigger, he raged, was our killing a thousand niggers in the South before they will learn their place again. But how did Tillman explain the brilliance of Booker T. Washington? By the proportion of white blood in his veins, Tillman said. Like me, Washington was a person of mixed race, whom Tillman described as the frustrated and no doubt futurist class of mulattoes. Mulattoes, Tillman stated, may be smarter than pure-blooded blacks and even the lower types of whites, but such exceptions to Tillman's law of the jungle were destined to become nothing more than oddities in racial science. Thanks, Grandfather Thurman, was all I could think when I read these theories. My great-grandfather, George Washington Thurman, had slaves of his own, but in the dozens, not hundreds. He was a cotton farmer, not a lordly planter. The Thurmans were not exactly aristocrats, unlike the Pinckneys and Rutledges of Charleston. 
They were not exactly aristocrats, unlike the Pinckneys and Rutledges of Charleston and the great rice plantations who had signed the Constitution, or the Hammonds and Butlers of Edgefield, whose vast cotton fields enabled them to live like English lords. The Thurmans had achieved a modern white color prominence through their legal and professional skills. They were nonetheless extremely influential, and the fact of their deep intimacy with Tillman made me think of them as savages themselves. I was glad then that Strom Thurmond had disappeared from my life as quickly as he had entered it. For a moment I had begun to think of myself as white, or at least partly white. If the tillman thurman axis was the source of my whiteness, I didn't want a drop of it. Black could not have seemed more beautiful. Chapter 4 Life with Father The war years were my high school years, and it was hard to study the past when the present was so dramatic. One benefit of the war was that it completely took my mind off my personal past, not that the past was coming back to haunt me in any way. I never got a letter, a call, a word from Strom Thurmond, and I barely saw my mother. I heard she was doing volunteer work in Philadelphia. I went back to Mary and James as my parents, and I committed myself to being the same plain teenager I always was before all these surprises about my birth came popping out of the closet. I re-embraced my original home and my black roots, and wrote off Strom Thurmond as a secret footnote to my personal history. I assumed I'd never see him again, and if I did, I, it would have no effect on me. It was much easier, being my old self. Of course, I was growing up. I was still a virgin and never thought I'd be anything else until I got married. Marriage was an unlikely prospect, with all the boys going off to war, the minute they graduated. Still, I liked to flirt, I liked to learn the new dances, like the jitterbug and the lindy hop. My friend May and I would go to the fancy Jewish dress shops, the Parisian and Cohen Brothers, where her mother had an account. Thanks to that account, we'd finally get to try on clothes, pretending how we'd go to New York City one day and wear them in the Easter parade and then to some fancy restaurant or nightclub like we saw in the Fred Astaire or Thin Man movies. We still loved the movies, even if half of them seemed to be about the war we got so much about in the papers and the radio. The best one was Casablanca, though I have to admit I felt closer to Ingrid Bergman than Dooley Wilson, the black pianist who played As Time Goes By. I began identifying with black successes in public life. In the movies, I became a fan of Lena Horne and Panama Hattie. I longed to see Paul Robeson on Broadway. I bought Nat King Cole's first smash, Straighten Up and Fly Right, and played it until it wore out. I must admit, though, that like any Bobby Soxer of any color, my heart belonged to the adorable Frank Sinatra, who was creating riots at the Paramount Theater in New York. I hated boxing, but I followed Joe Lewis, the brown bomber. I noticed when black soldiers did something heroic, when they became officers, when the Navy's first black captain took command of the USS Booker T. Washington. Blacks started raising two hands with what we called the double V, victory abroad and victory at home. Having had a taste of the South, even here in the North, I felt it would be a long time coming, and I thought a great deal about the hypocrisy of black soldiers giving their lives fighting a racist for a country that was still treating them in such a racist way. But patriotism quickly vanquished all negative thoughts, especially when the radio played some song like This Is My Country, or anything from the new hit Oklahoma, which made us all feel like pioneers with nothing but a wonderful new frontier ahead of us. When I saw that the WACs were finally accepting black women, I thought about joining once I graduated, if this awful war was still going on. Everything was rationed. Meat, milk, coffee, shoes, socks. The fancy Golden Dawn hosiery shop had nothing to sell, 
and the halls of Kresge's and the shelves of the A&P were half empty. Luckily, my family had a lot of good cooks who could make a little go a long way and taste great. Over dinners, we talked about the war and cried about people we knew who had died in it. But we also tried to enjoy life. We played records, big band stuff, anything by Duke Ellington or Glenn Miller's I've Got a Gal in Kalamazoo. We'd have fun going on about Hollywood romances, little Mickey Rooney and big Ava Gardner. We gossiped about the marriage of Cary Grant on whom we all had crushes to Million Dollar Baby, Woolworth Heiress, Barbara Hutton. Life was so unfair that a rich girl who seemed so boring to us could get this heartthrob. Movies, even more than baseball at the time, were the American pastime, because this was before Jackie Robinson, who broke the color line and gave blacks sports heroes with whom they could identify. Somehow movies were different, even up in the balcony, we never felt excluded from the projected fantasies. One day, the call came. It was late 1944, after D-Day had turned the tide in Europe, and things for the Allies were winning a lottery I didn't want. And why he didn't call Carrie, whom I had only heard from on the phone and hadn't seen all year, mystified me as well. Although I was ambivalent in my response, Mary didn't allow me any choice in the matter. I had to go see him. And as I thought about my true emotions, I felt unable to resist his siren call, despite the fact that, like Ulysses, it could result in my crashing on the rocks. I wanted to belong to someone, even if this particular someone might not want me to get too close. Every girl wants her daddy, and I wanted mine, however unlikely a parent he might be. I also wanted to ask him, as in the Bible, why hast thou forsaken me? But now he was here, and he wasn't forsaking me anymore. Yes, I was weak in saying yes to see him, but how could I truly say no? All the hatred, all the resentment I had built up as a defense against his rejection for me now had to go on hold. Nonetheless, I assured myself that I was ready to pull it out if I needed it. We took the train to Philadelphia. We didn't stop at Chester. According to Mary, Carrie was busy with her war efforts. Too busy to meet the man she loved? I wondered, but held back the thought. Carrie, for whatever reason, had abdicated her motherhood of me to her sister, affirming the decision made when I was born. I would have liked her to be a part of this homecoming, but it was not to be. We took a cab from the train to a large, anonymous businessman's hotel. I would have thought a man as distinguished as my father would have stayed at a luxury palace like the Bellevue Stratford on Rittenhouse Square. Not at this semi-flea bag. Maybe he didn't want anyone to see him. But if so, why was he bothering at all? It wasn't as if we had a deep relationship. Mary called him from the lobby, and he asked us to come up. It would have been nice if he had taken us out for a meal, but then again, given his family's deep beliefs, the sight of him in public with two black ladies was probably more than he wanted to handle. We went to the balcony, not to a bedroom, but to a day room that traveling salesmen would hire to show their wares. When Strom Thurmond opened the door, I was bowled over by how handsome he was. This was my father? Wow! He was all dressed up in his cocky uniform, his chest gleaming with medals, which were exceeded in their brilliance only by his piercing blue eyes. Most of what little Sandy here he had three years ago was now gone, either through age or the army bar barber. But he was tan and ruddy and stood amazingly erect. War had agreed with him. Hello, he said. Awkwardly. He had not met Mary before. He shook her hand, then turned to me and looked me up and down, as he had when we first met. How are you, Essie Mae? 
Before I could answer, he shook my hand in that powerful vice of his. I must have grimaced with pain. Are you feeling all right, young lady? I'm just fine, sir. It sure is nice to see you both. It is so nice to be back in the United States. He showed us into the small room and had us sit down at what looked like a card table. The room was Spartan, although there was a nice view of what looked like Constitution Hall in the distance. He offered us each a glass of water, nothing else. Esime, I hope you've been drinking water like I told you. I was amazed, he remembered. It's the only thing that's not rationed, Mary said, and Judge Thurman chuckled. The best things in life are free. He sized me up again for a long time. I hope you've been watching your diet, he said, as if he were accusing me that I hadn't. Try to avoid the fried foods, he admonished both of us. I know you all love them. Try to think how bad they are for you before you eat them. And no pot liquor, he continued his health lecture, referring to the mix of fat back and vegetable juice from cooking the greens with pork shreds. Just steam them. Vegetables are delicious by themselves. Let God do the cooking. Well, you sure do look good for a man who's been to war, Mr. Strom, Mary said. I haven't seen a vegetable for so long. I'm homesick. I miss that barbecue. I can't wait to get home to Mama. A home I'll never be invited to, I thought. My father told us all about his wartime experiences. It sounded a little like a lecture he might have given to the Rotary Club back in Edgefield, but I didn't take that personally. That was his style, a little bombastic, like that of a school teacher, which he had been. He liked to hold forth and go on and on, though not for the sake of hearing himself talk. He kept those blue eyes trained on Mary and me to make sure we were listening and learning. Nor was he a braggart. Despite all the medals on his chest, he spent a lot of time explaining how dull his first two years in the service had been, chained to a desk. They thought I was too old to shoot anybody but myself, he said self-deprecatingly. He told us how hard he had to pull strings to give up his exemption from service because he was a judge. Despite the nobility and rightness of the Allied cause, a lot of people were pulling strings to stay out of battle, not get in. He bragged to us how fit he was and showed off by making us feel the muscles in his arms. They were as hard as rocks, as firm as his handshake. He seemed a little silly, like a boy and not a judge. Yet, he had the medals right there to prove his valor. He entered the service as a captain at a military police battalion in Albany, New York, then rose to major at Governor's Island in New York City, where he was stationed for over a year, doing personnel work and lobbying to get sent into battle overseas. I couldn't help but wonder why he didn't arrange to see me like he was doing now on one of his leaves. Finally, in 1943, he got his wish, and by now a lieutenant colonel was sent to England. I love those cathedrals. He went on and on about how beautiful places like Westminster Abbey and Salzburg and Wells were, and how barbaric the Nazis were to be bombing those, these sacred monuments to Christian civilization. Savages, he called the Germans, somewhat ironically, I thought, for weren't they the master race of Aryans that Ben Tillman so admired? And wouldn't Ben Tillman have called blacks, like Mary and me, savages? And yet, here we all were, together. The judge made D-Day come alive for us. He flew over the English Channel in a glider as part of an airborne convoy of over a hundred such motorless planes, towed in the air by normal aircraft then released to soar on their own over Utah Beach, where the battle was raging. Neither Mary nor I had ever been in a plane. It sounded amazing and terrifying to fly without power like a bird with Germans shooting all around you. It was like a movie, but real, and the man bringing it all to life was my real father, which was still surreal in itself. 
The judge's glider crashed on French soil, and he was badly injured. As with his muscles, he showed off the scar on his knee by pulling up his trousers. That, I guess, was a badge of courage that he wore as proudly as his medals. He described the whole area as littered with crashed gliders, and how, under heavy fire and with blood pouring from his wounds, he helped unload a jeep from inside the glider and drive around the battlefield, rescuing other soldiers, all under heavy Nazi fire and bombs exploding all around him. After D-Day, he fought in the Battle of the Bulge and helped liberate many towns in France and Belgium. He went through an inventory of the decorations on his chest, which included a purple heart for being wounded, a bronze star for combat bravery, a French Croix de Guerre, and a Belgian Order of the Crown. Did you kill anybody? was all I could ask him. The opportunity did not arise, was his answer. His role in liberating the concentration camp at Buchenwald in Germany made a huge impression on him. He said savage was the word he kept using. He told us how when he entered the camp he saw a huge pile of bodies piled up like logs. Then one of the bodies moved and he felt as though he were in some kind of horror movie in which the dead came back to life. As it turned out, most of the bodies were alive. The Nazis had stacked them up to starve to death. They were too weak to walk, and they were just laid out in the rain and cold to die. My father called medics, and he and his troops disassembled this mountain of death and tried to save these poor people. The vast majority of them did not survive, my father said, always using big legal type words like majority and ultimately instead of saying most of them died. I suppose that's how judges were supposed to talk, an occupational hazard. My father mentioned other Nazi tortures he saw, skinning the Jews and using their skin as lampshades, smashing the heads of Jews with massive hammers. Savage, he repeated. We never had a, pro we never had a problem with Jews, he commented. There was a note of ruling class superiority in his tone that made me uncomfortable. He was passing judgment on the Jews, declaring them okay. But who was he to judge? Yes, he was a judge, but this wasn't a court. I reflected on the Jewish shops in the Edgefield Square, and I thought about the problem Jew of South Carolina, Franklin Moses. Then I censored my thoughts of racial supremacy. Nazi tortures and southern lynchings. These were natural thoughts for the times we were in, but they were not right for me. Here was my father, a war hero, making our world safe again, and I was blaming him for the wrongs of his father and of the South. They weren't his fault. After all, here he was with me. How bad could he be? He went on about the generals he had seen, Eisenhower, Patton, Omar Bradley, about how cold Europe was, about those English cathedrals and Notre Dame in Paris. The place with the hunchback? I interjected. You must go to a good school, he complimented me, surprised perhaps that I would have any knowledge of literature. Again, I veered myself away from unfair thoughts. What do they have you read? Great Expectations, Silas Marner, Moby Dick. He seemed even more surprised. That's very good, Essie. What about Shakespeare? Any Shakespeare yet? Somehow I felt it was my turn to show off. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Creep in this petty pace from day to day till the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. I couldn't believe the look on Mary's face. She had never once sat down with me to talk about my studies. She had no idea what I was learning. Well, I declare, Essie, that's fine work. You keep studying like that. There's no telling what you can do. Fine work, my father repeated. I'm not sure if he was proud of me or simply shocked. 
For a while, nonetheless, I basked in his approval. My less charitable thoughts returned when it was time for us to go. Judge Thurman never once asked about Carrie, never said, I'd love to take you to see those cathedrals, never said, I'd love to show you around Edgefield. He didn't say when he might see me again. All he did was to advise me to eat lots of carrots, which were good for my eyes. He had noticed my new glasses, and I had told him the story of my music teacher. That struck a health chord with him, one of his favorite subjects, and he expounded about carrots and vitamin A. I would tell you to eat liver, but I don't care for it myself, he said. But stick to carrots and spinach and leafy vegetables, and don't forget to drink plenty of water. He did not offer to buy us a new lamp or take us out for a healthy meal. He just handed Mary a large envelope. Here's something to help you out. Thank you, Mr. Strong, she said. Then he crushed our hands one last time and saw us out the door. There were no kisses or hugs. He didn't ride down to the lobby in the elevator. Is he ashamed of me? I asked Mary when we were out in the street. Ashamed, she opened the envelope and counted two hundred dollars in twenties, just like before. Do you call this ashamed? Two hundred dollars was indeed a lot of money, but spread out over three years, it wasn't that much. Wasn't a daughter worth more than that? That doesn't mean he cares about me, I said. It does to me, it does indeed, Mary said. Again, my meeting with my father soon felt like it had been a dream. I didn't hear from him or about him at all. He told he had told us he was going to the Philippines. I prayed that nothing awful would happen to him in the Pacific Theater. I worried when I didn't hear from him that it had, but he had been out of touch in New York and then Europe, and now he was out of touch in Asia. What difference did it make? I still held on to an insane, unrealistic hope that he would come home and one day, some way, somehow, we might be a real father and daughter. It was back at my job in Coatesville Hospital and back to school for the 12th grade. 1945 was the year we won the war, and uh, an unforgettable one in many ways. I wept when Roosevelt died of a stroke in April down in Georgia. He had looked so tired in the newsreels. The nurse in me said something was wrong, and it was. I knew America would never get a leader like that again. He seemed so compassionate, despite being so rich and patrician and different from poor people. He was the patron saint of poor people. He led us out of the depression, out of the war. What would America do without him? I didn't have a lot of confidence in his successor, Vice President Truman. With his Missouri twang, he seemed like a farmer, like someone from Edgefield and not a statesman, yet he would prove us all wrong. Context of white supremacy. So that is audio segment one. Uh, we will pick up. We're midway through chapter four. Uh, we'll pick up at the segment Mussolini and his mistress. New paragraph we'll pick up at in chapter four. Uh, once we are done with our dialogue, the number to dial if you have comments, questions, 720-716. 7300 decode 564943 pound press star 61 if you would like to participate the number again 7207167300 decode 564943 pound Press star 61 if you would like to participate. The email untiljustice at gmail.com. Untiljustice at gmail.com. Quickly, before we get to some of the folks who dialed in, wow, the supplementary material for this book could be on par with O.J. Simpson for people who were with us when we read the people versus OJ Simpson, the run of his life. Wow. Lots of additional material. So much has been written about uh, OJ Simpson, the same. Well, I don't know if the same, but there's a lot of material on this book as well. 
uh, been able to get back to the University of Washington Library. Many times white people have so many resources. Wow. So one of the reports out of many, many that I found, I will try to see if I can get in as many as I can. Last week, I read the report, Janetta Rose Barris. I thought that was so important, talking about life without a father. This week, and this one, I had to do some extra work. Maybe I'll have time to share. This piece written by Hazel Trice Edney for the Tri-State Defender in Tennessee, titled Strom Thurmond Raped a Black Teenager. This is from December 31st, 2003, shortly after Strom Thurmond's uh, passing. A 22-year-old Strom Thurmond having sex with his family's 16-year-old black maid should not be seen as an affair as it has been widely portrayed in the media, but rape, a well-respected black sociologist says. You could call this a statutory rape because this person was about 16 or so when this happened, says Julia Hare, executive director of the Black Think Tank in San Francisco. There are the types of things that we need to look at very seriously when we look at these double standards. Essie Mae Washington Williams, 78, a retired school teacher who now lives in Los Angeles, decided to tell her secret in order to bring closure to the subject and finally answer persistent questions from reporters. For years, Thurmond and his family had remained silent and in some cases expressed doubt about the veracity of stories accusing him of fathering a black daughter just days before the daughter had called a news conference to offer evidence that Thurmond was her biological father and to say she was willing to submit to a DNA test, the family finally confirmed the validity of her claim. Washington Williams says she had not come forward earlier because she didn't want to ruin the political career of Thurmond, who died in June at the age of 100. Thurmond was a virulent racist who ran for president in 1948 on a pro segregationist platform. He said at the time, and I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that there is not enough troops in the army to force the southern people to break down segregation and admit the nigger race into our theaters, into our swimming pools, into our homes, and into our churches. In 1957, three years after the U.S. Supreme Court outlawed segregated public schools in its famous Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, Thurmond filibustered a civil rights bill for a record 24 hours and 18 minutes. The bill, which eventually passed, was the first civil rights legislation passed since 1875. It provided the authority for establishing a civil rights office at the Department of Justice to enforce federal anti-bias laws and to investigate complaints of civil rights violations. It also provided for voting rights enforcement and established criminal civil rights violations. NAACP Board Chairman Julian Bond notes the contradiction between a white southerner who considered blacks inferior while sexually exploiting an African-American teenager in private. It is a story, most of all, of great personal hypocrisy, says Bond. How a man can preach racial separatism and practice interracial sex in defiance of then-current laws of his state and defiance of his entire public life. You wonder if Strom Thurmond and others like him ever had any convictions about anything at all. The variety of complexions and hair textures among black people are everyday reminders of the slave owners who took advantage of black women. We are like a rainbow, says Hare, and we're still suffering from that because we bought into those light-skinned, dark-skinned issues. It took us into good hair, bad hair, and can you pass the paper bag test? These types of things. Representative James E. Clyburn says 
the Congressional Black Caucus is an example of that rainbow. You look at the Congressional Black Caucus, he says, do you think Harold Ford is a hundred percent African American? Psychiatrist Dr. Francis Cress Welsing of Washington, D.C. agrees that Thurmond was involved in more than an interracial affair. I think that the first thing that black people should think about is the context in which this occurred, she says, context. and that this woman, this teenager, did not have a choice. If she wanted to protest and say, he was forcing me, who would have listened to her? Roger Wilkins, professor of history and American culture at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia, agrees. People have said to me, can you believe this? I say, how can anybody my color not believe this? Chuckles a light-complexioned Wilkins. This should open up a much more honest conversation about who we are. There are really two things to be said about this, that we're all a part of the same species and there are no innate differences. Hypocrisy, the failure to match private behavior with public utterances, also dogged Thomas Jefferson, the nation's third president. As author of the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson extolled the virtues of liberty, yet he owned almost 200 slaves, none of whom he freed on his deathbed. DNA tests confirm that Jefferson fathered at least one of the six children of one of his slaves, Sally Hemings. Jefferson was a very complicated human being. He was inconsistent on a lot of things, says Wilkins, author of Jefferson's Pillow, The Founding Fathers and the Dilemma of Black Patriotism. He explains, I believe he was the father of Sally Hemings' children, and I think that it was sexual hypocrisy of the highest order because he, at times in his life, talked about the dangers of race mixing, and yet it's fairly clear that he was continuously involved with this woman. Thurman's alliances were also well known in his home state. Everybody knew, recalls Congressman Clyburn. I knew it very explicitly. It's just about as widespread as anybody I know of. More people know that than know who's running for president. When asked why he had not discussed Thurman's behavior, Clyburn replied, Why should I? This is like asking me why I didn't announce the rooster crowing. Another South Carolina native, conservative talk show host and columnist Armstrong Williams is a longtime defender of Thurmond for whom he once worked. Senator Thurmond was in Miss Essie Mae Williams' life and had always provided for her, he said on a recent Hardball with Chris Matthews television show. When she lost her husband in 1964, he stepped in not only for her, but her children making sure they received an education beyond high school and whatever she asked for he was there not completely says Hare the psychologist he could say that he paid but he still primarily was deadbeat psychologically because this is a person who couldn't say publicly who her father is Again, Hazel Trice Edney Strom Thurmond raped a black teenager, the Tri-State Defender, December 2003, reference to the grandsister, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. Mm. Right and exact. Let us get to the phone lines, star six one, if folks have commentary on the first portion of the reading. Uh, yes, sir, we can hear you. Proceed. Uh, good evening to the host uh, and all the participants. I hope everyone is having a good evening. Um, 
I one of the thoughts I had uh, upon your reading of that um, that last article was uh, someone saying that Strom Thurmond uh, supported her all her life uh, in whatever she wanted she received. She uh, so far has never received anything other than a handshake in the form of any type of uh, affection from her father. And over uh, the course of 18 years, it appears from her uh, telling of this story that he has given her approximately uh, $400, maybe $500. Uh, I don't know sure what that would equate to today, but over 18 years, that's certainly uh, a pittance. Um, and in Chapter 1, I thought that the uh, the way that she was describing the story was that it was very confusing, and I think that I agree with many of the other uh, callers and the host who uh, may say that this uh, this author it sounds a bit very confused about racism, white supremacy, and I thought that she was even confused about uh, to whom she should be asking questions um, regarding her parentage. In chapter one, she thought that her mother would have um, have the answers uh, to why her father um, uh, did not, you know, keep in contact with her, uh, save for the one time that they met previously, and then uh, the second time uh, in some uh, dingy hotel uh, room that they had met. Uh, they had met twice, but it seems like he would be the person to ask those questions of to uh, get any legitimate answers. Uh, forgive me if I miss uh, some of the names of the characters, uh, but the um, the older lady, uh, I believe her name was Calypse, who described um, freedom from slavery as a, a play, I thought was uh, you know kind of interesting. I'm not sure exactly uh, – how that would uh, equate to a play, but, you know, uh, maybe this uh, person was describing it the best way that they can, and I just uh, am not able to completely understand it. But uh, also in the first chapter, when she described the birthright uh, claims that she would have as a, uh, a uh, I guess, a great, great, uh, great grandchild of a Civil War um, veteran, uh, who was a Confederate Civil War veteran. It seems like those uh, claims would never uh, apply to her, but she, it, that, I guess, speaks to some of the confusion that she may have. And she describes some of the confusion that she had as uh, uh, sometimes even thinking of herself as a, a white person, but it seems like reality came to um, came to her pretty quickly that she, under, she seemed to embrace being a black person but it seems at first that she was very confused about her racial identity, and I could certainly um, understand that confusion. Um, and also it, it um, was interesting uh, to me that the, the red shirts, uh, who were people who were described as the red shirts, um, it was interesting because I, at first I thought that they were acting in official capacities and uh, shooting down these um, – these black, uh, these black people with uh, with weapons, with guns, uh, and the way that they did that, I thought was uh, uh, indicative of uh, race soldiers who just don't have a badge, but they know that they are race soldiers. And I believe that this book actually pairs quite nicely with the previous book, the uh, the Man in a High Castle, um, because it it sort of uh, juxtaposes and compares the um, treatment of the uh, uh, the folks who were in the extermination camps in Nazi Germany to these people who were shot in the head and hunted down by these red shirt race soldiers uh, in this case. It seems like those people uh, were red shirts in this case, in this uh, part of the world, in this hemisphere, and on that side of the hemisphere, they wore brown shirts, but acted in the same capacity. Um, 
And uh, one of the things that I, I really been uh, in reading this in, in terms of the great grandfather who was a Confederate general um, uh, going down to the grandfather and the father um, who were all uh, very, very strong cultivators. The, the father, Strom Thurmond, seemed like he was uh, very knowledgeable about horticulture and about um, maybe I'm making, missing that word, uh, um, but um, it seems like he's very, very knowledgeable about agriculture, and it seems like he is very, uh, um, he is ingenious at cultivating the relationships uh, that would uh, hide his secrets. It seems like all of these men were ingenious uh, cultivators, um, going back to the person who uh, convinced his former slaves to um, speak well of him in front of an audience to Strom Thurmond um, having his, uh, uh, his rape victim and the uh, product of that rape uh, to speak well of him or to at least uh, think well of him and to keep his secrets. It actually reminds me of the, uh, the book uh, Renithia Tate wrote. Um, I can't remember the name of it. Oh, gosh. Pieces of a puzzle. Uh, pieces of a puzzle, exactly. Thank you. Um, that, you know, she says that these great victims of these white people, I, I guess men and women, are we keep their secrets. And it seems like um, Strom Thurmond cultivated the relationship with his victim and the uh, daughter to keep his, uh, his secrets. Uh, I think that that's ingenious how they, uh, I mean, it may be malicious, but it's certainly, uh, it requires great thought. Um, and I, one of the things I thought about in the second chapter was that, and you can cut me off if I'm going on too long, I apologize, uh, is that the the parenting of uh, this woman is pretty unthoughtful because they seem like they sprang upon this uh, girl, this child, that, her, uh, who she thought were her parents were not her parents, and that her father was a white man, uh, and they kept bringing her to him in a uh, very uh, unpredictable manner. Um, I think for both of her mothers, uh, they just bring this person up, and uh, here, this is, here's a surprise. And with no thought given to how that would affect her. Um, but, um, oh, yeah, one of the other things I thought about was the way that she describes him, and it seems like a very opulent way. He's a very grand person. It reminds me of the way that the uh, royal person in England married a, a non-white uh, woman, female, uh, it seems like the same way with the, all of the medals on his uniform. It seems like it's the very same description in that he's thought of a, uh, as a, uh, as a, uh, a very um, strong, the, the picture of strength um, when they uh, display him. It seems like it's, it, it's very much a mirror of the same way that they uh, portray that person who is in a tragic arrangement with uh, a non-black female, no, excuse me, a non-white female uh, in England. Um, that's all I have to share for this evening, and uh, thank you for listening. Much obliged, sir. Uh, I'll get in really quick since you mentioned the part about the description uh, after the Civil War concluded and during Reconstruction, it was like a play. That passage reads, uh, it's Calliope, I think is the pronunciation. So she's talking to Miss Essie May. She says, the Yankees ran that show. She recalled she could barely remember having the vote. We had it, and then they took it away. It was like a school play having our people in the state house, but then they canceled that play, and they took our vote away. They called it civil rights, but there wasn't nothing civil about it 
Uh, I will nab some of the other folks who dialed in, but just my quick thought on that. Now, there are a few points where Calliope is saying some things. I'm like, wow, victims guaranteed qualified. This wasn't one. This one, getting that in context, you can, maybe if you have time, you can share and let us know if that clarifies. But I thought like, at least my interpretation of this was like, this is not for real. This is like some, oh, we'll let you look. And she called it a school play, not even just a play. Like, oh, we'll let you little nigger children pretend and you can go in Congress and pretend and vote and then canceled. Get out of here, niggers. Get out of here. You're not in charge of nothing. And that's, this wasn't even, you know, legitimate. They're uh, just messing around and acting like they're working against racism, white supremacy, and going to let us participate. And then, bam, back to, you know, being regular niggers. Uh, let's see. Other folks who dialed in that uh, we have not heard from. Do you have commentary? Greetings, everyone. Retired firefighter in Florida. Uh, yes, uh, I uh, was uh, compar- comparing it, comparing uh, uh, her, her uh, expressing her uh, background. Um, which is in the same uh, means that is the results of racist white supremacy is non-white people are confused. It sounds, you know, very confusing uh, uh, as far as her understandings of things and uh, white people know exactly what they're doing and the results that, uh, that comes after uh them uh, psychologically mistreating us. Uh, she has this notion by stating that half of herself is white as though that's a biological uh, equation, but actually it's a political one where a group of people decided to mistreat people based on color. Uh, it has very little to do with biology uh and in turn non-white people still today are confused about that uh the story is taking the taking the shape of uh as i can recall from only from watching the movie uh it's similar to etta james the great etta james singer who in in real life, uh, it was reported that she never did really not know. Well, it was no, it was known by others anyway that she really did not know who her father was. But she suspected her father was the famous pool player Minnesota Facts. Uh, and uh, in the movie, it showed. I don't know if this was ha- really happened in real life or not. But in the movie, he, it, she set up an appointment with him and was, uh, well, I'll put it this way, Minnesota Facts in the movie didn't, didn't act like Strom Thurmond. He was not tactful at all <laughs> when it came to uh, Miss James, uh, whereas Strom Thurmond, which I'm not surprised because Minnesota Facts, I would assume, was a more of a street type, type of person. And and Strom Thurmond was a uh, leading white supremacist, uh, very controlling, very technical, very professional uh, racist white supremacist. Uh, and uh, uh, and through through that relationship, uh, you had a child that suspected some some thoughts about her father, but yet and still she was intrigued by his power and kind of like from the reading so far is expressing some levels of, of pride. Well, you know, that's my dad, you know, and that sort of thing. Uh, I also observed in the first half that uh, some of the, non-white black relatives in their confusion. Uh, one of the reasons why they would take her to these meetings is to get that money. <laughs> uh, uh, th- that, the suspicion from that, from me, is due to the last report that the uh, lady that was with her 
was stating, you know, about the amount of money, although it really it really doesn't come to anything uh significant as far as money is concerned when you look at it over the course of time. Uh it also was a, a, a how they are able to confuse non-white people uh, is through the movies, uh, you know, with the allowance of non-white black people going to the movies during that time when she was growing up. And for the most part, the, the uh, main characters in the movies were all white people, and they were... Uh, politicized in a way that it would draw your attention and, and it also would direct your understandings of what's beauty, what's handsome, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, the male actor in Going in the Wind, the, the principal actor, I can't remember his name, but he was picked uh, directly because he looked like the former heavyweight champion uh at the time a little bit earlier it was before joe lewis i just can't think of the, that white guy's name that was the heavyweight champion of the world uh part of his nickname was the mauler because he looked like that and they wanted that type of uh tough guy look uh to be in the movies and and that basically attracted also the attention of a whole lot of black females during that time uh, when it came to black stars uh, during that time, uh, or black people that that white people could point to, well, see, see, look at Lena Horne, look at Joe Lewis. They only needed about two people during that time. Now, you know, with, as time goes on, uh, they they have they uh, in order to keep the the business of white supremacy alive and working well, uh, they have you know quite a few more. Uh, perhaps even the two that are being talked about around the world <laughs> presently now with with the term of this called a slap around the world. But anyway, uh, yeah, all, those were those are some of the observations that I had in the uh, in the in the reading uh, so far in the first half. Thank you. Much obliged. Uh, retired firefighter in Florida. Uh, let's see, our caller in Ohio should be with us. Uh, I believe that reference was uh, the Manassa Mauler, Jack Dempsey. Uh, exactly. Caller in Ohio. Thank you very much there. Uh, I have a, uh, have a slight answer for someone who asked about the money uh, that Thurman was giving. Uh, this is just a rough estimate. So $200. Uh, in 1960, we'll just take 1960, and I'm gonna work backwards. It's roughly worth about a thousand nine hundred and seventeen dollars today. Okay, uh, that same two hundred dollars in 1930 today is worth roughly three thousand three hundred and ninety-seven dollars and eighty cents. So I don't know how frequently Mr. Thurman was giving money to uh, his rape victim for their needs or how much of it. But just so you have a rough estimate of what that money would be worth today, of course, it's adjusted for inflation. Uh, and we also have to consider there's a difference in how the economy was structured back then. So $200 back then probably, I'd say, went further than it does today, given we have so much free-flowing credit. I believe they're on the gold standard up to the 70s. So take that into account. But uh, on to my observations, one of the things that I noticed, I believe it was uh, at the beginning, um, she stated something about uh, the sweet nectar she was going to drink from both cups or something like that. And my first thought was like, well, what sweet nectar do black folks have? Because I've been black all my life, and I can't recall any type of sweet nectar. I've had a lot of things that are poisonous, but not sweet nectar. Um, I've also... Uh, kind of taken aback by the fact that she stated that she was uh, both black and white, and it definitely rings in my ear that she was completely confused about how race actually works because of, uh, you know, 
it, 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 I, whenever I hear that, it's just like, wow. You, people think race is exclusively like a skin color thing as opposed to a, 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 a really a organizing principle, but I could be in air with that. Uh, it was interesting to hear her speak of um, their fear that they had a Hitler, right, and and how terrible of a guy Hitler was, and even Mr. Thurman spoke about that. And what's very interesting about Hitler is that Hitler got his whole get down. And let me not use that metaphor. He Hitler got his plan for what he did in Germany from America. Actually, Hitler had people who studied the American model. And a really good book that I've been able to read is called Hitler's American Model. It covers that. Actually, Hitler looked at America as a Aryan supremacist country. That's how Hitler stated it. He didn't call it white supremacy. He said America was the first Aryan supremacist nation, and actually his interest was to work with America hand in hand. What was interesting about what um, Thurman spoke about uh, when he was talking about he had no problem with the Jewish folks, that's actually something the only critique that Hitler had of America was he didn't like how much – I guess I'd say freedom that uh, – or, or I'll, I'll say how, how big of an influence Jewish folks are allowed to have on the economics of America pertaining to their participation, everything from the slave trade to owning businesses to their political clout that they had in America. That was Hitler's biggest issue with America, but outside of that, Hitler actually anticipated working with America and looked at America as – uh, Germany's big brother. So to hear uh, Mr. Uh, Thurman speak about that was quite interesting. Um, I, I have a question. Mr. Tillman um, stated, actually I'm going to say this, it's not a question first, but a statement. Mr. Tillman stated uh, something about lynching black folks was something of a, a positive. That's very interesting because that's a similar sentiment that Mr. Ragbeer Redbeard Ragnar stated in the book, Might is Right. If you get to read that book, there's a, a section in there where uh, the, guy, the author, I believe his name is uh, Arthur Desmond is his real name, but uh, Redbeard Ragnar is his pseudonym that he wrote under. But in there, he speaks about the justification for the violence that was being done to black people in, in America, and he uh, pretty much used a similar argument that, you know, it was good for the Negro and it helped them have discipline and, you know, there was nothing that wrong with it because in other societies and civilizations, uh, you know, those types of activities occurred, et cetera, et cetera. And so as uh, I hear Mr. Tillman, you know, that statement come from Mr. Tillman, that really kind of clicked with me. But given the fact that the book um might is right. I believe it was written like the 1890s or something like that. Considering Mr. Tillman was around around that time, I would find it quite, I wouldn't find it surprising if he actually has read that book or knew Mr. Uh, Ragnar. Um, let me see what else is there here. I found it interesting that her father uh, took her to these free bag motels. It appeared that every time they met up outside of her meeting them at the uh, law office, up to this point, it seems like he uh, doesn't really have an interest in taking her out anywhere nice, I guess you'd say, for the uh, type of wealth he comes from. And uh, oh, a question that I do have is uh, about Mr. Tillman. She's in the in there. They spoken about the Reconstruction era. Uh, the Reconstruction era, from my understanding, ended with the Hayes Tillman handshake or agreement. My question is, is this the same Tillman, or is this Tillman related to the guy whom that handshake agreement was around? I don't know if in the book that was covered, but when I heard the name Tillman, my first inclination was, is this the guy who the Hayes-Tillman agreement was uh, built around, or is he a relative of him? Um, And my last statement that I'll say is uh, there was a question that was asked in the book where where she spoke about the – like uh, the convictions, or actually in the article, I think it was, about the convictions of these pro-segregationists having relations with 
non-white women. And one of the things that I've come to realize is that what their conviction is, they believe in white supremacy. And to have that, the only way you can operate is by situational ethics and moral relativism. So whatever it takes to keep it going, that seems to be their code. Like, just whatever the situation presents, adjust to that as long as it doesn't interfere with white supremacy. And with that, I'll meet my line. Much obliged, our caller in Ohio. Uh, Let's see. I will try to get in some of the listener notes and a few of my notes before we push off to our other uh, section. If other folks have commentary, star six one. Um, let me see. I'll get in some of our listener notes really quick and then get in a few of my notes before we get to the uh, folks who dialed in. Let's see. The one of our investors wrote in greetings, Gus. After listening to last week's broadcast, it struck me that the word boon coon referenced as a street in Edgefield, South Carolina, mentioned in the text has a definition. Insincere speech. Oh, bunkum. Pronounced it incorrectly. Bunkum. Bunkum. Insincere speech making by a politician intended to please local constituents. Ironic given the history of the Thurmans. Bunkum. I've used that word uh, a few times. Chapter 3. Number 1. Edgefield. Rifle Clubs. Hamburg. Ben Tillman, Red Shirts, the Hamburg Massacre, General Wade Hampton, places and names which are all familiar to the listeners of the Cows Book Club selection, Ben Tillman, and the Reconstruction of White Supremacy, 2015, the Summer of Dylan Storm Roof. Number two, Hampton, his biggest campaign asset was his mama, Nellie, M-A-U-M-A, uh, who, had him, who had raised him. The bizarre behavior of racist man and racist woman having what you consider subhuman animals, wet nurses, and take care of your children, thus starving and denying their own offspring. Masters starve their slaves, do not allow them to breastfeed their young. From the Cow's Book Club selection, The Delectable Negro by Vincent Woodard, mentioned yesterday. Number three, Radical Republicans. The word radical always seems to come up when the issue is treating black people better. Hmm. Number four, Ben Tillman was good to his people, she said, meaning his slaves. Now, see, that's what I mean, where Calliope has a few times where I was like, hmm, victims guaranteed qualified. This is one. Such thoughts are not surprising given the abuse and subjugation that slaves endured. Indeed, maybe a form of Stockholm Syndrome. She may have been raped, too. Number five. George Washington Thurman, he was a cotton farmer. The Thurmans had achieved a modern white collar prominence through legal and professional skills. If the Tillman Thurman access was the source of my whiteness, I didn't want a drop of it. It is fascinating the distinctions that the author is making between her white ancestors and the slave owners who had large plantations. Clearly, she is rationalizing their behavior sad chapter four blacks raising hands double v for victory the double v for victory sign campaign started after a letter to the editor from james g thompson was published in the pittsburgh courier newspaper on january 31 1942 the most widely read blacks newspaper at the time reference what was black america's double war henry Louis gates jr the root number two Bellevue Stratford Hotel. This hotel became notorious in 1976 when 29 people staying in the hotel died of pneumonia-like disease. Most were a part of an American Legion convention, thus the pneumonia was known as Legionnaire's disease. It was later identified as due to a bacterium in the air conditioning system. I found it interesting primarily because I stayed there a few years before the outbreak. Lucky for you. Uh, Let's see. I don't think we got... Yeah, we didn't get that far yet. Didn't get that far yet. We'll have to pick up. We'll come back and pick up there once we read a little bit more from Chapter 4. Okay. My notes. Let's see. See if I can go quickly. Uh, She says, confusion. I can't say that when she starts the section we read today, Strom Thurmond, what was he doing with me? He's part of a long Edgefield uh, tradition. 
Uh, another aunt told me that Judge Thurman was supporting my mother. That was why she didn't have to work. I didn't ask her about the arrangements. Uh, supporting her, how? Like, how much money is he giving her? Is he giving any money to Mary, who's taking care of her? Is he sending, like, them a check? Cash? Anything? Taking care of children is expensive. Uh, she says she dreamed of getting a letter from her father. If he were a true gentleman, how could he just forget me like this? How could he be that cold and distant? Uh, he had seemed so interested in me. Was he only being polite? The only person who could answer that question was Carrie, and I needed to be alone to ask her. Father hunger, deadbeat white dad. And this would be another one for anybody saying that he was there for her. Like, really? The first 16 years he was there for her? Okay. Uh, deep in the heart of Texas, we've heard that one a few times on the cows. Um, whew, we are so in the pocket, meaning... Wow. Given what we just read, Man in the High Castle, given Dr. Horn being with us yesterday, given the program that should be with us this Sunday, like, wow. Uh, she says, war was all around us, but none of my friends thought we as Americans would go to war. Now we had been attacked and we had no choice. We were all scared, scared of Hitler on the one side and the Japanese on the other. Many of the boys in high school immediately began enlisting. Heard yesterday, not all of the black boys enlisted Elijah Muhammad, Minister Malcolm X many others uh, let's see there are many times where she and other black people speak about different white people with pride uh, so this is uh, Carrie speaking with Miss Essie May she says yes but he's lieutenant talking about Strom Thurmond knowing everything about him judges are exempt but he's very patriotic and he knows the right people he's an edgefield man she said proudly they need to fight it's in their blood his grandfather was right beside robert e lee when he surrendered war runs in the family now that's even one like now process what you're saying the war is white supremacy racism we're going to war to keep our negras that's the pride of an edgefield man war fighting is in their blood now that's what Ben Tillman said scratching the white man the savages there and all that like wow you're saying that there's some sort of biological motivation to go out and practice racism and be violent wow then after that she says but is it our family I wanted to ask her talk about being the poor relations we were the invisible relations Ralph Ellison what bothered me most was that my mother never told me that my father said goodbye to me as he was going off to war this is still her father race soldier rapist all of that that's still her father father hunger that's Janetta Rose Barris that's how we started with that but wow, I mean that confusion this right here the incorrectness when you play around with sex and this isn't even playing around this is being raped by a white man the joke the confusion of the offspring oh it is so sad in so many different ways she says uh so he leaves didn't send her a letter she says he was overseas for over a year but i didn't know that at the time maybe he did love my mother or maybe he used her but where I was concerned, my father didn't seem to care. The father hunger. And think about that as a child. I got to think now. And then again, now it's right in your face. He raped my mom. She's a child. This is not a romance. Like, what are you talking about? The rationalizing. He raped my mom. It's right in your face. But you got to be thinking like, dang, did he love my mother? No. Maybe he used it. Now, who wants to sit around and think about that? Maybe that's what runs in his blood the blood of an Edgefield white man she says I wanted to find out the worst about this forbidden family so that I could hate them and want nothing to do with them after all did they not formerly own slaves and was not Will Thurman the genius who put the pitchfork in the hands of Ben Tillman so that he could wield it against the black people and what was my father up to what kind of justice to blacks did he dispense didn't he rape my mother wanted to add now she's asking all of these questions my thought was how did she get from here wanting to get this information to hate her family to he's wonderful that's what she heard when she was speaking at the Strom Thurmond Institute at Clemson University Strom Thurmond is wonderful that is what domination looks like and that is white father hunger 
she continues, she was never whipped. Oh, this is talking about Calliope, a uh, Calliope, sorry. She was never whipped or chained or abused in any way. She said she worked in the house, not in the fields, but even there she recalled no brutality. How can that be when you've already talked about, this is Calliope who was saying that's the edge field tradition, raping black females. That's the brutality right there. Probably black males too. It doesn't get any more violent than that. And this is so common where you will hear white people and some non-white. You know, slavery wasn't that bad. We never lashed anybody. We didn't starve anybody. We had plenty to eat, grew our own vegetables. I had my own horse. Maybe this white supremacy racism thing isn't that bad. If you can get over them raping your child every now and then. She continues. She says, uh, mm, 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 mm. she says, in essence, my white family had gone to war against my black family. Talking about the civil war confusion. Uh, 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 uh. The rifle clubs, the red shirts, Ben Tillman, the reconstruction of white supremacy, raping black males. That's been the theme for the whole year. Zachariah Walker uh, chasing black people is like hunting foxes. Uh, the bodies remained on the ground for days for no one dared come out to bury their friends for fear of joining them in the hereafter. White terrorism and what have you reminded me of Michael Brown Jr. as well. Uh, let's see. Mama Nelly and the folks who pointed that out, generations of race soldiers can do whatever and they can still find, manipulate black people to come out and say whatever. You know, I love Ben Tillman. He's awesome. He was just a politician, which is exactly what some of the people said about Strom Thurmond. I might have even been uh, SMA Washington Williams saying he was just politics. He just did that to stay in office. He loved black people. What? Like, victims guarantee qualified and confusion. Though I just keep saying that over and over. And again, that's why we had Janetta Rose Barris, father hunger, whatever happened to daddy, this little, little girl. That's why we had that in front to keep that in mind as we proceed. Uh, again, so last week, Strom Thurmond was referred to as the Lord of the Plantation. This week, Ben Tillman is the new Messiah for ending reconstruction the school play uh let's see she said uh the more i learned the more i wanted to wash those white people right out of my black non-cheerleader hair but a lot of white people thought the pitchfork was a great man and i kept on reading to try to understand why i think that's important too when we read ben tillman's biography that was the question that i kept asking why does this man have a statue like what did he do what okay so we put that aside that he was racist and terrorist and didn't want black people to go to school at Clemson or Winthrop University and blah 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 and challenged white people to duels and lied on white politics we put all that to the side so what is enduring what do we want to emulate from Ben Tillman he was well spoken he said nigger publicly that's courageous I guess I don't even know. I said that over and over as we read the book. Like, what is the reason we need a Ben Tillman statue in 2022 unless we still got the same fear that he had of Negro domination, which that is every page of the book that's coming on Sunday. Uh, Let's see. Agricultural Moses. We just keep on with the religion of white supremacy metaphors. That's when she's talking about Ben Tillman. She said, nobody spoke as good as he did. Calliope reminisced about Tillman. Again, she spoke without rancor, which confused me. That is the word for the book. Uh, Calliope continues, he didn't hate me. She replied, when you live as long as I have, you best think about love, not hate. I don't even know what that means. If anybody wants to take a crack at it, feel free. I have no idea. We're in a system of white supremacy, and I want to focus on love in the midst of child rapists and terrorists. Where is the love? Jay-Z. Let's see. Uh, Raping black males. Let's see. Uppity Negras that was uh, brought up yesterday during World War II. Uh, 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 uh. 
they give all these phony tests for black people so that they can't vote. Uh, let's see. Oh, wait a minute. She says, I read a speech Tillman gave in which he advocated lynching as an acceptable form of justice for blacks and exhorted the mob to kill, kill, kill the Negro rapist, which is what he reduced all black men to be. Tillman styled himself the great defender of white southern female purity, if not chastity. I wonder what he would have thought of his wizard's son, my father. Now that right there is confusion. This has been going on for generations. Calliope already told her that you're doing exactly what I was doing. That's an edge field man. We like a little dark oak. Black females, black males, black children. That's what we do. Not understanding racism, white supremacy. Uh, let's see. Booker T. Washington getting invited to the White House. We talked about that before. That being a huge scandal back in the day. Ooh, let's see. I didn't even get to chapter four yet. My goodness. Um, she talks about being a virgin. I said, my gosh, are we back with Lucky and Alice Seabold? Uh, Lena Horne is one of the big uh, to do. She's married to a white word. Yes, married to a white man. Malcolm X talked about that regularly. Uh, Frank Sinatra just came up. My goodness, Frank Sinatra. Talk about child rapist and the exact same thing. How do I know this? Because we read another memoir, Woody Allen, apropos of nothing. Uh, Mia Farrow was 16. Frank Sinatra was 47, 48 when they got married same age massive age difference child rape really that's another one like laws that we have today that's not it's none of that romance and blah 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 child rape call it what it is uh, 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 and she loved Frank Sinatra didn't everybody her heart belonged to the adorable Frank Sinatra not the Joe Lewis the brown bomber her heart belonged to Frank Sinatra again that is the power of white supremacy racism and that continues even today you see how powerful Netflix is that screen uh, let's see da, 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 da. the hypocrisy of black soldiers giving their lives fighting a racist country we just talked a whole book about that race war yesterday with Dr. Gerald Horn go back and listen to the archives and even then she talks about how all they had to do was play a song like this is my country and it would get her back in the correct direction uh, we got another talk about her being excluded and placed up in the nigger seats at the movie theaters. But even then, she says, I never felt excluded from the projected fantasies of Frank Sinatra and gone with the wind. No less like, wow, Hattie McDaniel got her an Oscar, too. She didn't smack anybody. I'm going to bring that up. Um, my last note, be my last. I took so many notes. What would be my last one? Um... She says, let's see, what, what will be last one before I get to it? When she says, the blue eyes. This is not my last one, but I thought that was important. She mentioned it two times. He's blue. He's so handsome and all these blue, like the child rapist. Really? And he comes back and all this talk about all the savages. Man, you got to go back and hear the program with Dr. Gerald Horn. When white people talking about kill jab, kill jab, kill jab, kill jab, kill jab, and making a game out of taking the teeth from non-white people, japs, and putting emphasis on, we don't do this when they're dead, doesn't even count. Got to get the teeth when they are alive, and then make a necklace out of it. And you want to talk about savage Nazis. That's in case, by the way, Isabel Wilkins' second worst book I've ever read about the collaboration between the Nazis and the U.S. She has some extensive portions uh, about that that's accurate. Uh, but the last thing I was going to get was the section where she said, even her calling him her father, like this is the second time that you've seen him. 
I don't know if that qualifies him to be called a father. Like, it's way more than just, I raped the child, now I'm a father. Like, are you serious? John Henry Washington is way more of a father than this lame, deadbeat dad raping racist. Uh, the last thing uh, was, there we go. Then I censored my thoughts of racial supremacy, Nazi tortures, and Southern lynchings. They were natural thoughts for the times we were in, but they were not right for me. Here was my father. This is the second time she's met her father. A war hero. War white supremacy. We talked about that yesterday. He might have even been one of the ones over there. Getting these Japs. Kill Japs, kill Japs, even though she said he was on the European front. I don't think they were going around doing that, getting German teeth, making necklaces out of them. Talked about that yesterday with Dr. Horn. Uh, she says he was a, my father was a hero making our world safe again for white people. And I was blaming him for the wrongs of his father and of the South. They weren't his fault. After all, here he was with me. How bad could he be? Father hunger? Wow. This is what happens. And I mean, it's not even logical. It's not even based on evidence. Strom Thurmond is responsible for black people dying, just like Ben Tillman, black people being killed. All that violence that happened, the Orangeburg massacre and things of that nature where black people were being killed. And even just scratch all that out black people being denied education because of racists her mother calliope people that she knows all these piles of black people that she talked about black males that she talked about that don't have jobs and can't go to school and what have you that's because of her racist white father and men like him what do you mean it's not his fault but that's what I expect really from victims of white supremacy it's just this sort of really misconduct or victimization is just really acute when you have a white parent just in a biological sense because this is not dead be white dad we'll stop there oh it's right in my face we just read this yesterday hey did you know Eisenhower is a German name that would be one to think about when they talk about all this they interned all these Japanese Americans it's boatloads of German Americans like Eisenhower where that didn't happen now why is that what does it mean to be same thing she said about you had a whole lot of people who pulled strings not to fight now why is that white brotherhood man the Nazis are our brothers we collaborated remember now because this one is in pink, so I guess I was supposed to read this. Somehow I felt it was my turn to show. Oh, she did all the Shakespeare. I don't need to get that in. Um, yeah, we'll leave it there. Uh, the money, I'm glad we got the inflation calculator. I think that would be a strong motivator for the family to want to bring her to meet Strom Thurmond to get this money. Uh, the inflation calculation that I did, it would be approximately $3,600. So that might motivate a whole lot of victims of racism. Like, we're going to go and be nice. We're going to wear our best. And don't you say a word about raping racist Strom Thurmond. Get this money. And I'm not criticizing at all. I'm just saying that's logical, you know. Not that far removed from the Depression at that time. We'll get to audio segment two. I took so many notes for this book. It's crazy. Uh, we'll get to audio segment two. If you have thoughts that you didn't get to share, take a note. Back after section two. This section is short. Context of white supremacy. S.E. May Washington Williams Dear Senator, whew, tragic arrangements. Audio segment two. Mussolini and his mistress, Clara Pitacci, were hanged in Milan. The attention to the mistresses of the worst two men on earth brought that term unpleasantly into my consciousness. I hated to think of my mother as someone's mistress, but that's what she was. And it was a miserable position, even at the top. After Hitler committed suicide, the diaries of his mistress, Eva Braun, were made public. She wrote about how badly, how indifferently he treated her, all the lies and broken promises. 
She said she wished she had a dog instead. That made me think about my mother as well. What was she getting out of her romance? If that was what it was with the judge. Envelopes of $20 bills? That wasn't romantic to me. Not enough to put up with the hopelessness of it all. Maybe he was better to her than to me. I was only a daughter, an accident, but she was a goddess. Maybe he was seeing her. Maybe she was getting the love I was not. I never saw her either, so I couldn't know. I kept having these conflicting emotions, caroming between pride and at my ancestry and regret that these two people had ever crossed the path of my awareness. As a senior in high school, I was forced to make some career decisions. I had always privately hoped I would attend college. That seemed to be the passport to a better life. Since I had very good grades, I think I could have gotten into a good college. However, in those days, blacks, especially black women, rarely got a high education. That was a luxury we couldn't afford. Scholarships were rare. Plus, our families needed all the income an able-bodied child could bring in. And so most of us went to work, rather than staying in school. My nursing apprenticeship provided me with what seemed a logical compromise. I would go to nursing school. As a little girl, my career dream had been to become a nurse. Even if college couldn't happen, at least another dream could come true. My five summers at Coatesville Hospital were the perfect resume item. I was well qualified to go to a nursing school as part of a big city hospital. Tuition was free. Plus, I would earn an income as well while I was working toward my nursing degree. Earn while I learn. It seemed the right thing to do, if not the only thing. The three best nursing programs for black women were at Mercy Douglas Hospital in Philadelphia, Freedman's Hospital in Washington, D.C., and Harlem Hospital in New York City. These were all basically black hospitals with mostly black patients, although each had a number of white doctors on staff. It didn't occur to me to apply to a program for one of the great university hospitals like Columbia Presbyterian or Massachusetts General or John Hopkins, though I might have been qualified to get in. I guess I knew my place, my white father notwithstanding. There were talented blacks at all these institutions, but I was too locked into the self-perception of race limitations to try to test the color lines. I was shy and self-effacing and had never really been away from home other than that one trip to the South and a few visits to Philadelphia. So going away at all was a big deal. I was much more comfortable staying with my own people. Penetrating the white universe was far too intimidating a prospect. If my own white father didn't want me, why would anyone else? I chose Harlem Hospital mainly because my half-brother, Calvin Burton, was now living in Harlem and working for the post office. He would look after me. The idea of having family in the big city was reassuring. Furthermore. I had always wanted to live in New York, especially after all those Fred Astaire and Thin Man black and white odes to Art Deco, skyscrapers, cocktails, tuxedos, jazzy foxtrots, and fast-talking sophisticates. It was the most glamorous place on earth, and the total opposite of everything I had known up to this point in my life. I was more than ready to take the A train. Calvin embodied all the glamour I associated with New York. He looked like a movie star. At least like a movie star such as Billy D. Williams later on. There were no black male movie stars when I first landed in New York. He dressed in dashing clothes, natty suits, ascots. Whenever he came home to Coatesville, he'd tell us tall tales of Harlem nights, about the clubs, the music, the restaurants, the people from all over the world who came up there to swing. It sounded like the American version of Paris's Bohemian Left Bank, 
except that it wasn't occupied by Hitler and it was black. After Calvin graduated from high school, he had gone into the Civilian Conservative Corps, one of Roosevelt's New Deal programs. After Pearl Harbor, he volunteered and enlisted, but he was soon discharged when the Army doctors discovered he had a heart problem that he didn't know about. He then went to work at Worth Steel in Delaware and met and married a New York City girl who brought him to Harlem and changed his life. I hoped Harlem would change mine as well. I said a fairly unemotional farewell to Mary and my stepfather. It wasn't like I was going overseas, or at least that's what I told myself to keep from crying. I had never lived away from home before, and I was a little scared and a lot excited. Carrying a big suitcase with the nicest clothes I had to wear on those Fred Astaire nights, I took the Pennsylvania Rail Railroad by myself to New York, passing Philadelphia, and wondering what my mother was doing. We had talked on the phone, and she seemed very excited about my big move, praising me for being accepted by all those prestigious programs. I hoped to have time to go and visit with her, or better yet, have her come to visit me in Manhattan, where my fantasy was to show her the town and go to a Broadway play together and watch all the fancy gentlemen in the office get knocked out by her lovely looks. I was a little sad to be on the train all alone, but the anticipation of my new adventure made me forget the lonely thoughts. I myself was knocked out by the sight from the train of the skyscrapers across the Hudson River. I had seen them in magazines and in the newsreels, but here they were, looking even taller than I imagined. I could make out the Empire State Building, the tallest in the world, and my heart started racing. The train disappeared into a long tunnel. When I emerged at Pennsylvania Station, it was like I had left small-town life behind and entered via a space capsule a whole new world. The station was an immense Roman temple with thousands of people passing through and bright lights advertising everything from camels to coke to Chevrolets. There were lots of men in military uniform and lots of others in the corporate uniform of dark suits, carrying Wall Street journals. I could feel the surge of big business all around, the energy of the metropolis. Thank goodness Calvin appeared to greet me, as I was overwhelmed by all the bustle. He had on a tweed jacket and a silk tie and seemed very sophisticated. We shared a big hug. We stood in a taxi line and got a cab uptown. New York cab drivers were famous for being big talkers, but ours didn't say a word. Only to grunt with annoyance when Calvin gave him the address in Harlem. I got a sore neck from craning my head out the window, looking at the skyscrapers. How in the world did they build them so tall? We drove up 8th Avenue, and Calvin pointed out Times Square and the great theaters. I saw the marquees for Carousel and On the Town. I knew the music from the radio and excitedly hummed it to myself. Here I was, for real. New York, New York, a wonderful town. The Bronx is up and the batteries down. Why wasn't Harlem in the song? I asked Calvin. We've got our own music, he said with a warm smile. The cab entered Central Park, and suddenly the city became the country, with horse-drawn carriages and endless greenery. It was September, and the leaves were turning brilliant colors, and it was magic. Through the trees, I caught glimpses of more skyscrapers. Calvin told me they were apartment houses on Fifth Avenue and Central Park West. Who lives there? I asked him, full of question. Rich people, this is a money town, oh boy. As we drove out of the park, the buildings resumed. They were apartment houses, five and six stories, much lower than the skyscrapers that were everywhere else in New York. Some had fancy striped awnings on the windows, but most looked run down. Lots of men, black men, were just standing on the sidewalk as they had been in the South. Welcome to Harlem, Calvin said. 
As we kept heading north, a lot of the buildings looked bombed out or burned out. This wasn't the Harlem of my imagination. I guess I expected a cotton club on every corner, fancy stores that sold the natty clothes Calvin was wearing. Instead, I got a war zone. We had a big riot here two years ago, Calvin explained. Because of the war, there's been no money to rebuild. A riot over what? Black and white. What else? He said. He told me how a black MP had stood up for a black woman, whom a white policeman and Irishman, all the cops here were Irish, Calvin said, was arresting for being drunk. The cops shot the MP, and all Harlem went wild. We're in Europe and Asia fighting and dying for America, but in Harlem we're still second-class citizens, Calvin summed up. The pot had been boiling for quite a while, Calvin said, ever since the New York police commissioner had declared Harlem off-limits to all white servicemen. The commissioner blamed the staggering rate of venereal disease in the military on Harlem's prostitutes and began the biggest vice campaign in the city's history. We don't like our ladies, honor impugned, Calvin said with a sad smile. In the riot, hundreds of people were injured. Hundreds of buildings and stores burned and looted. White owned, Calvin pointed out. We know who our friends are. Calvin lived with his wife and a young daughter in an apartment house on 118th Street off 8th Avenue. The stoop was filled with loitering men, sleeping and reeking of liquor. The building looked as if it had once been grand, with columns and ornate brick designs and stained glass, but those were better days. Inside, the halls were dirty and reeked of leaking gas. Calvin said it was full of hotbed apartments, which meant the landlady would rent a room to two separate lodgers, one by day and the other by night. Calvin's own apartment was small but very clean, with a lovely view of the steep, lush landscape of Morningside Park, topped by the great rotunda and classical academic halls of Columbia University. Calvin called Columbia the American Acropolis because of all the famous scholars who taught there. It was a school, he said, for white geniuses. Where, I wonder, did black geniuses go? A lot of black geniuses were associated with my new home, Harlem Hospital, on Lenox Avenue and 136th Street. After meeting his wife and child, I was taken directly to my new home by Calvin, who gave me a lovely sweater as a welcoming present, plus a little keychain that was a miniature stethoscope. Good luck, Doc, Calvin said, hugging me as he dropped me off. I'm so proud of you, little sister, he said. That remark provided a universe of security to a highly insecure young girl, and it gave me the strength to face my intimidating new world. I was assigned to a nurse's dormitory with a young lady named Corinna from New Jersey. In my class of 40, there were women from all over the country, as well as from Africa and the Caribbean. All the girls seemed very worldly and confident, unlike myself. All of them were black, or at least shades of black. By contrast, about a quarter of the doctors at Harlem Hospital, a grand Georgian complex surrounded by trees and covered with ivy and looking like a university, were white. Apparently, for a doctor, especially a surgeon, there was no better training than here. The violence in Harlem provided a unique and unmatched catalog of injuries and wounds on which to operate. This place is to stab wounds what MIT is to physics, my new roommate said. Assault trauma was the technical word. You get more violence in Harlem than any place in the country, and all the violence ends up here as medical case studies. You got diseases here, tropical diseases, malaria, beriberi, that you don't find elsewhere, not downtown for sure, and doctors eat that up. With immigrants from all over Africa and the Southern Hemisphere, Harlem was one big medical laboratory, and Harlem Hospital was the heart of it. Harlem Hospital started out as white as Harlem had, a fancy uptown for rich Manhattanites who wanted to live in the country. 
By 1904, the subway was opened as far as 145th Street and 7th Avenue, so the country was only a token away. In the 1920s, however, after World War I, black people from the South began streaming into the North and needed somewhere to live. Realtors, who had overestimated the original demand for Harlem, began renting to blacks to fill their empty apartments. The old black neighborhood in the West 60s, which was known as San Juan Hill in honor of Theodore Roosevelt's black Rough Riders who fought in Cuba beside him, gave way to this new one, and the whites who occupied these fine buildings made an exodus of their own to the upper west side of West End Avenue and Riverside Drive. It was another meaning of the phrase, the Harlem Shuffle. The people from the South thus went from sharecropper cabins to luxury flats, originally rented to upwardly mobile immigrant Jews with steam heat, electricity, private toilets, and elevators. It must have seemed like the space age to them. For all this luxury, though, the new blacks in Harlem couldn't get decent medical care. Harlem Hospital, if it treated blacks at all, did so in a similar way to Coatesville Hospital putting them in the poverty ward, or far worse, using them as medical guinea pigs, testing machines, and therapies on them without their knowledge or consent. Up until 1920, there was not a single black doctor on the staff to stand up for his people. It became known in Harlem as a place to go and die. In the 1920s, a great uproar arose over this heinous practice and black doctors began to be recruited. The leader of Harlem Hospital's transformation and the director at the time I arrived was Dr. Louis Wright, probably the most famous black physician in America, born in Georgia, the son of a doctor. Wright had graduated from Harvard Medical School in 1915. Despite this, he could still not secure an internship at a white hospital. He thus went to the Freedmen's Hospital in Washington, D.C., which was affiliated with Howard University Medical School. After heroic service in World War I in France, where he nearly died from being gassed on the battlefield, he went home to Atlanta to begin his practice. The racism there, which he had tasted at Harvard and in his early medical days, inspired him to go north, where he might both do better and do more good than he could in Georgia. Like many educated blacks, Dr. Wright blamed many of Americans' current racial woes on President Woodrow Wilson. Despite his international idealism and wartime success in making good on his motto to make the world safe for democracy, Wilson was a Virginian whose condescending attitudes towards blacks were a product of his upbringing. Wilson was very much a separate but equal man. He believed in segregation in government jobs, which was a major step backward for blacks, federal employees. It was also a symbolic retrenchment that emboldened racists throughout the country. The Ku Klux Klan, quiet for decades, held a 40,000-man march on Washington. Southern senators were able to block the first anti-lynching bill that had been brewing since the Red Summer of Blood of 1918, when a huge wave of lynchings had swept the South. Blacks left the South to make a living, but they also left to save their lives. One of these refugees, Dr. Wright, came to New York and became a leader of the NAACP. Because of his Harvard credentials, a lot of Northern black physicians, mostly educated at Howard, resented Dr. Wright and felt he looked down on them. It was well known in Harlem that wealthy and famous blacks invariably chose white downtown doctors, and block doctors were understandably insecure. Dr. Wright was not. His mission was to create a black medical corps that was equal to, if not better than, the Twin Towers of Medicine in Manhattan, Columbia Presbyterian, and Cornell New York Hospital. I was profoundly honored to be on Dr. Wright's team. Perhaps because everyone was trying harder to make Dr. Wright's point, 
Harlem hospitals seemed like a boot camp to me. I didn't think humans could work that hard. I'm sure the slaves in the cotton fields didn't have any worse hours than we nurses did. Another part of the reason for our endless hours was the recent appointment of Mrs. Alida Daly as superintendent of nursing. Mrs. Daly was the hospital's first black appointee. Even though all the nurses had been black since Dr. Wright's upheavals in the 1920s, the supers continued to remain white women. As the first of her race on the job, Mrs. Daly must have felt she had to be a drill sergeant, and she was. I had to wear a strict and dowdily old-fashioned uniform of a long blue dress, black stockings, and black shoes. My first autopsy nearly killed me. The late patient had had lung cancer, and when they cut him open, his lungs were as black as tar. I never even thought about having a cigarette after that. Somehow it didn't bother the other girls in my class who just smoked away. They told me I was too sensitive. I was learning a lot about medicine, but I was too fatigued to take stock of any of it. The regimen was endless. We'd get up at dawn to prepare for surgery and observe and sometimes assist at operations. Then we'd work on the wards, changing catheters, drawing blood, dressing wounds, assisting with x-rays, and worst by far, preparing corpses for the mortuaries. Whenever we weren't on the wards, we were in class, learning all about medical tests and procedures, and memorizing laboratory ranges and evaluating symptoms. I must have come down with at least five fatal diseases in my first month. So mighty was the power of suggestion in learning about all these exotic maladies. What turned out not to be hypochondria were the constant colds I would get. No, they weren't lung cancer or tuberculosis, as so many of us students thought, but we still felt rotten, and were susceptible to a lot of contagious maladies due to our low resistance. I rarely got more than four hours of sleep at night, and sometimes, if I saw an empty room, I'd flop down on the bed and fall into the deepest sleep before the screams down the hall would inevitably wake me up. It was definitely a test of our stamina. I suppose the idea was to teach us a kind of professional grace under pressure, but to me it seemed like they were pushing us beyond human endurance. And we will leave it there uh, until next Thursday. Uh, we're still in Chapter 4, Context of White Supremacy. Get enough rest. Sleep is super important. The number 720 seven one six seven three hundred the code five six four nine four three pound press star six one if you would like to participate uh let's see all of the folks who dialed in if you have a hand up commentary to share uh line should be open do not wait till the last minute if you think you have a question or thought to share especially if we've not heard from you at all uh, retired firefighter caller in Ohio. Uh, you all should be with us. Nab other hands as I see them. Yes. Uh, just wanted to uh, add on uh, from the uh, first half. If <laughs> I'm going to get nauseated if I hear her use the terms we and us uh again uh, uh when it refers to the uh activities of white supremacy to either adjust itself uh to remain uh uh the the uh number one conquering force on the planet uh and you know non white people especially non white black people are uh, including themselves uh with that by using the term we and us uh uh and i heard that a lot in the in the first half uh of the uh of the reading uh also uh there was a an, an attempt to make it seem like uh the uh uh treachery in the terror ter treachery in the uh 
the means of uh, warfare was only on the side of the Axis powers, uh, whereas uh, in England itself, uh, the uh, the top officer, top of top official of bombardment, uh, he had the name of Bomber Harris because he was bombing places to actually make the citizenry of Germany to succumb to the terror of bombing, uh, where nothing was uh, there but but people. Uh, the whole idea about uh, World War II and uh, black people participating, uh, white people didn't necessarily have any importance for non-white black people to, to participate other than uh, duties such as uh, uh, handling equipment and putting it on ships and stuff like that. Uh, very little combat. Uh, one of the few units that did com that was trained to do combat. One of them was the tank battalion that that uh, the great Jackie Robinson uh, was in, and we know what happened to him that he didn't wasn't able to go overseas. Uh, but most of them were uh, units that just moved around supplies and stuff like that. Uh, matter of fact, when it came to medals, as medals were expressed in in the first half of the of the reading, uh, the only the, the the one of the Medal of Honor uh, recipients didn't get a medal until uh, the Obama administration, and was fortunate enough that this guy was still alive at the time uh, to get uh, this Medal of Honor, uh, but. Uh, Primarily, they play, they played, uh, they paid, uh, participated in non-combat type of uh, situations. Even the Tuskegee pilots wasn't really wanted at all. Really, wasn't really wanted at all. Uh, I think one of the fans of it that kept it going was was Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, when she because she visited Tuskegee. Uh, to basically and became, you know, somewhat impressed about what was going on out there. And she kept after her husband about about that particular type of situation. Uh, with the second half, let me think of something of the second half, then I'll shut up. Uh, uh, well, I'll just uh, stop talking to somebody else, and, and I'll come later on. Thank you. Right on from uh, retired firefighter in Florida. Incidentally, I was looking. I just read about the compromise, the Hayes Tilden compromise uh, for the 1877 or 76 election. Um, so many books. Have to go back and get the highlight. Hopefully, I'll be able to find it before we get back on the air. Ideally, compensatory call in, and I can share where it was. But, uh, well, that's one. It's Hayes. Tilden, T-I-L-D-E-N, compromise, not Tillman. So that's one, although South Carolina is one of the important states for all of this controversy around this election, and Mr. Tillman is uh, involved in some of that nonsense. Uh, I just want to go back and get the exact uh, document that I just read that was talking about all of this in detail in context of white supremacy. But, yes, we will uh, check on all of that. I'm sure Mr. Tillman was involved. That was his heyday uh, in some way, shape, form in uh Massive fraud all throughout, not just South Carolina. Massive fraud. Uh, any other commentary folks want to get in? Twenty seconds, Gus. Uh, uh, nursing was one of the few other uh, jobs that black females were able to obtain other than primarily day work. Nursing was one of the the things that uh, was kind of like an upgrade for because for that during that time most black females their work was considered to be day work meaning working in a white woman's house at some capacity. Hmm. Much of or a teacher or a teacher, and primarily from there as a teacher they would have went to a historical black college. Much obliged, retired firefighter in. 
Florida. That's going to come up in this here text as we move along, HBCU. Uh, let's see. I'll share a few of the notes that I have, and then we'll double-check, uh, see if anybody else has additional comments that they want to get in. Man, I've taken lots of notes <clears throat> in this uh, text. So she says, uh, so she, this passage, as I said, it starts, Mussolini and his mistress, uh, Clara Pataki, uh, were hanged in Milan. The attention to the mistresses of the worst two men on earth brought that term unpleasantly into my consciousness. I hated to think of my mother as someone's mistress, but that's what she was. Pause. Your mother was a child being raped by a white man. That is not a mistress. That is a victim of racism and rape. Even if she had been 55 at the time that this happened, she is a victim of rape. Same thing that I read in that report. Same thing that Dr. Francis Cress Welsing said the grandsister mentioned on this one. She said, could she have said no? to Strom Thurmond and that would have been it age doesn't even matter she's not a mistress that's not even like <laughs> that is not correct understanding of it at all and see that sort of understanding that warps your brain computer where that's what you think I am some sort of illegitimate child I am the poor relations child uh, my mother was a mit wrong 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 Strom Thurmond we shouldn't be thinking about him as oh, wow he's a proud war hero and making the world this is a child rapist she said he went to the Philippines probably raping non-white females in the Philippines because it's a long record that's how white people get down World War II especially when they get to go to like Vietnam Korea you can ask Mr. Fool about that one Vietnam Korea any of these places the Philippines ooh. Oh, got some dark ladies, some dark children. We just read about that yesterday, raping. And in fact, it was raping a young Chinese boy. That's how white people get down. So, I mean, hey, ain't nothing to be proud of here. And the shame is not to Carrie Butler. Uh, she continues. She said, same paragraph. That made me think about my mother as well. What was she getting out of her romance? Now, she does put it in quotes, but... <laughs> this is not an affair this is not a romance all of this is just totally incorrect understanding of all of this confusion and it, it everything is just so tack I keep saying that like this should be a better word but I mean oh it's just so despicable and tacky all of this and then you try and find some way to butter and say that it's a romance or a let no call it what it is it is absolutely disgusting child rape she says, uh, what was she getting out of her romance? If that was what it was with the judge, if, good question, envelopes of $20 bills, that wasn't romantic to me because it's not, not enough to put up with the hopelessness of it all. Maybe he was better to her than to me. I was only a daughter, an accident. Now, that says that this is such a sad book, and I mean in so many ways, I mean downright depressing. And then, sad, as I've written, uh, tragic arrangements. The, when you talk about the joke is on the offspring, I think of myself as an accident. And I think of my mother as some sort of whore or what have you. Mistress. What? In the, <laughs> that's total F for black self-respect. Total F. I'm looking at my, wow. This is a war hero. Look at those blue eyes. Oh, he's so... What? Confusion, she says. Uh, maybe he was seeing her. Maybe she was getting the love. I was not. No, I never saw her either, so I couldn't know. I kept having these conflicting emotions. Caroming between pride at my ancestry and regret that these two people had ever crossed the path of my awareness. Easily one of the saddest books that I've ever read. Uh, she continues, she's talking about school. She says, I think I could have gotten into a good college. However, in those days, blacks, especially black women, rarely got a higher education. Pause right there. Now, we read Dr. Tommy Curry, the man not. We had Dr. Uh, T. Hassan Johnson as a guest on the program. 
there is lots of evidence and I mean old moldy evidence going back a hundred years approximately black females have outnumbered black males at college for as a century as long as Strom Thurmond has been around that's been the system of white supremacy racism and the data backs that and hey she hasn't said over and over and over and even this week she hasn't said she's seen piles of black people outside with no job doing nothing that's not what she said repeatedly and in numerous states everywhere she's gone what she said consistently is it's black males that doesn't add up if all of these black males are going and dominating school and then they can't get a job now even that would well, wow how did they get all these degrees and then they can't get employed no that's not the way that white people like Strom Thurmond and Ben Tillman that's not how they run the plantation let's see she says you don't have black doctors now we talked about I talked about that repeatedly went into detail about that continue she said uh, I'd always wanted to live in New York I just mentioned Woody Allen he's a part of that making all these films that romanticize New York Frank Sinatra was his big hit New York New York, New York, all of that. Um, Watching all of these, that's really for white people. This is not New York for black people, as she finds out when we get there. Uh, Oh, and they just mentioned the Lindy Hop. She talked about that dance, Welsing moment. I thought Dr. Welsing talked about we can share dances, victims of racism, black people, and they'll be around the world. They were literally just talking about the Lindy Hop on NPR today and all over the world black people made this dance it's been around so long and she just mentioned it in the book today like wow uh, let's see so she says uh, da, 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 da. shout out to Billy D. Williams uh, let's see lots of males in military uniform we just read all that about uh, World War Two. So she's hanging out with Calvin in New York. Uh, let's see. Oh, see, blah, 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 let me get that in. They were apartment houses, five and six stories, much lower than the skyscrapers that were everywhere else in New York. Some had fancy striped awnings on the window, but most looked run down. Lots of men, black men, were just standing on the sidewalk as they had been in the South. That's what I mean. Like, what? That doesn't even add up with what you said repeatedly. Uh, As we kept heading north, a lot of the buildings looked bombed out or burned up. This wasn't the Harlem of my imagination. I guess I expected a cotton club on every corner, fancy stores that sold the natty clothes Calvin was wearing. Instead, I got a war zone. That's still it today. They had all those fires, remember, in the Bronx? Just within the past few days, that's where they warehouse the black people at black people are in a war zone that is the whole planet of white supremacy racism Ukraine to the HBCUs right now Uh, she says uh, oh we got a black a white policeman beating up a black female it was an Irish police officer we talked about with that with how the Irish became white Noel Ignatiev guest on the cows way back when black people standing up for him said that repeatedly she has so many examples in this book where black people are not lames and chumps and cowards where they are trying as best they can from a very weak position to fight for themselves to at least you know have some uh, self-respect and you know defend themselves as as best they can I think that's super important because white people tend to try to conceal this information deliberately Uh, let's see the commissioner blamed the staggering rate of venereal disease on the military on Harlem's prostitutes and began the biggest vice campaign in the city's history we don't Want, we don't like our ladies honor impugned Calvin said now all of that like hey if that's the case then Strom Thurmond and all of them should stay away right and Minister Malcolm talked about this extensively for New York specifically right he said that's where he was doing his thing pimping and criminal activity and hooking white men up with sexual access to black people I believe that was males and females we read that in the book club too though uh, let's see. They continue. She says the stoop was filled with loitering men, sleeping and reeking of liquor. We just talked about that. The look, the building looked as if it had once been grand with columns and an ornate brick design and stained glass, but those were better days. Insides were halls were dirty, reeked of leaking gas. Now I just said, hey, it's 2022. 
uh, 80 years later and they just had all those fires right there in New York City uh, 19 people I think they had 19 fatalities uh, where they had uh, not up to building codes and what have you the fire doors didn't work and all of that progress right that's what they'll say uh, let's see Mm-mm-mm-mm. Uh, having a problem with affordable housing that's another one doesn't seem like we've made a whole lot of progress in 80 years on that one either she asked the question where I wonder did the black geniuses go hmm let's see she says uh, she's talking about uh, all the women when she's doing her nursing starting her nursing career she says uh, of the other nurses and folks who were in school with her she says all of them were black or at least shades of black I thought cowbell right there uh, Strom Thurmond that's why um, shades of oh, okay. by contrast about a quarter of the doctors at Harlem Hospital a grand Georgian complex uh, surrounded by trees and covered with ivy looking like a university were white that continues to be the case today uh, where you just don't have lots of black doctors and that is a deliberate part of white supremacy racism um, oh, oh my gosh it's so important so important for so many reasons so she continues she says uh, the violence in Harlem provided a unique and unmatched catalog of injuries and wounds on which to operate. Now I just said I believe yesterday being nonviolent with other non-white people is super important in my view major component of replacing white supremacy with justice being nonviolent with other non-white people but this is like something white people have instigated black people to be violent with other black people put you in conditions where you have poor housing fire trap as they call it no education can't get a job all of this stress you're being terrorized and then you can just take it out on other black people they instigate this and then oh my gosh the Negroes are dangerous oh they're rapist oh Negro domination and then these conditions continue 80 years later you have the exact same thing uh, let's see. She continues. She says, "This place is the stab wounds. What MIT is the physics? Woo! What an analogy of white supremacy, racism. Jesus Christ." Um, she says, uh, "All of the violence." Uh, and I was like, "Woo! Just wow! Be nonviolent with non-white people. One way we can help solve this problem. Let's see." Anything else I get in up until 1920, there was not a single black doctor on the staff to stand up for his people. It became known in Harlem as a place to go and die. I have heard that about many black hospitals uh, throughout the U.S. uh, where, yeah, this is going to be a shabby place, underfunded and, you know, whatever. And this is the type of thing you can mention when they talk about black people and their apprehensions about going to see a white doctor, not Nurse Rivers. Uh, let's see anything else so much of this black soldiers coming back and we're not going to take this anymore and all the red like hey we've heard that a lot even Jackie Robinson there's quite a few uh, folks who, who've done that over and over again uh, we talked about Woodrow Wilson few times Red Summer is a whole book uh, Cameron McWhorter white man who talked about the numerous lynchings and what have you that happened all over the country including Washington DC 2011 that should be in the cows archives uh, let's see she says I'm sure the slaves in the cotton fields didn't have any worse hours than we nurses did mm, I any of those comparisons to like slavery like generally speaking Unless a white man is coming up and like raping you and snatching your child from birth and selling them, I don't think you're treated like slaves. Even the hours. Like slaves, technically, you're never off the clock, technically, as a slave. Just saying. Uh, let's see. Most of the supervisors are white women. Heard that repeatedly. Uh, the smoking. Ugh can end with that when she talks about they did the autopsy the black lums minister malcolm x talked about that as well no smoking drink your water 
Uh, let me see. One of our listeners, he wrote in. I'll get in a few of his uh, notes before we wrap up. Uh, one of our investors, so some of the ones that we missed from Chapter 4. I says, number two, Bellevue Stratford Hotel. This hotel became notorious in 1970. Oh, we already read that one. Number three, Mercy Douglas, Philadelphia, Friedman's Hospital, Washington, D.C., Harlem, New York City, black hospital, mostly black patients, number of white doctors. Mercy Douglas closed in 1973. The name comes from the merger of two hospitals in 1948 and the School of Nurses, which was founded in 1895. Both institutions were plagued by a lack of resources from their inception. The Rise and Decline of African-American Hospitals in Philadelphia by Moira Schoffler, October the 2nd, 2020. Number four, Harlem was off limits to all white servicemen. Commissioners blamed the staggering rate of venereal disease in the military on Harlem's prostitutes. The supposed hypersexuality of African Americans leading to increased rates of communicable diseases has been a recurrent trope in previous book club selections. This was discussed in previous book club selections, Packing Them In by Dr. Sylvia Hood Washington. From the text, Dr. E. Mayfield Boyle, 1912, suspected racist physician, wrote that the tuberculosis outbreak among African Americans was due to a number of factors, including promiscuous kissing. Get real. Number five, Harlem doctor, no better than training there. This place is to stab wounds what MIT is to physics. Similar statements are made about several public U.S. hospitals that treat large numbers of black people. Grady in Atlanta, Cook County in Chicago, and the original Martin Luther King Harbor General Hospital in L.A. Uh, I think New Orleans had one that got closed down. Charity Hospital. That was it. We talked about that one in uh, Katrina after the flood, but that one got closed down. Number six, uh, Theodore Roosevelt's Black Rough Riders. Teddy Roosevelt became famous for changing up San Juan Hill during the so-called Spanish-American War. Charging, sorry. The truth is that black soldiers beat him to the top, and he acknowledged initially that it was due to their bravery that the victory was achieved. He later changed his story and gave credit to the white officers under whom the black soldiers served. The Rough Riders, the untold story of black soldiers in the Spanish-American War, Jerome to seal reading more important than watching television. Number seven, Harlem Hospital, the director at the time, I arrived, Dr. Lewis Wright. This passage made me think of Dr. Robert Pershing Foster, whose life was detailed in The Warmth of Other Sons by Isabel Wilkerson, one of my favorites we read on the book club. Number eight, President Woodrow Wilson. Wilson's tenure as president of Princeton is discussed in the Cow's book. <sighs> Cal's Book Club Selection, Einstein on Race and Racism by Fred Jerome and Roger Taylor. We did indeed. Uh, yeah, remember, they talked about how he showed Birth of a Nation at the White House. Woodrow Wilson did all that, making sure that they had uh, white supremacy, racism, and government hiring uh, at the White House. He was president at, uh, yeah, pff, that's funny, but anyway, yeah, yeah. Much obliged to our investor. We'll get back uh, to Chapter 4 next week. Uh, with that, much obliged for everyone's participation in the broadcast. Hope it was worthy of your time and energy. Uh, we will be back for the book club next Thursday, and we'll be here tomorrow for Neutralizing Workplace Racism, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, feel free to email if you have questions, comments, what have you, until justice at gmail.com. Much obliged to our narrator again. I'm so glad I don't have to read the book. Whoopee. With that, sobriety would be best. Uh, we need to be excellent decision makers uh, amidst all of the white supremacy racism we are experiencing. Whew, anything that we can do to help us solve this problem immediately. If you're out and about, someone is being loud, hostile, this is not a time for confrontations with strangers. If you didn't leave your residence, prepare to kill and or die exit you have no idea if they're armed maybe armed with an entourage if you're in a vehicle you're buckled up you're sober you're not on the cell phone doing the small things that we can to minimize contact with race soldiers and we need all of our attention that said creator we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people victims of white supremacy we ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times in all places each and every time 
we are in contact with another black person minimize conflict with other black people victims of white supremacy counter racism we are about non-violence with other black people Cal signing out thanks all for tuning in